Order. Good morning, everyone. It's nine o'clock and we have a very good, full, busy day today here at Law Amendments. I'd like to welcome everybody here to this session of Law Amendments Committee for Monday, November 16th. My name is Gordon Wilson. I'll be your vice chair for a while. Mark Fury is the chair of this committee. He'll be sitting in a little later. So I'd like to just start by reminding everybody that cell phones are to be off that uh, or on vibrate that no uh, photography is allowed other or video videoing other than by the media and um, the sessions will be uh, commencing very soon i just like to bring to everybody's attention that this is live streaming uh, we are very pleased to be able to, to offer that I would encourage all of the members uh, of the committee to ensure that they um, uh, speak clearly and present their questions and follow the uh, lead of the chair to make sure that we get this recorded properly for Hansard. Um, our timing is going to be 10 minutes for presentations and 5 minutes for questions. And with, uh, without saying any more, I'd like to start with introductions. Uh, Ms. Chender. Claudia Chender, MLA for Dartmouth South. Susan LeBlanc, MLA for Dartmouth North. Brad Johns, MLA for Sackville Beaver Bank. Good morning, Carla McFarlane, MLA for Picto West. Yes. Rafa Di Costanzo, Clayton Park West. Kelly Regan, MLA for Bedford. Keith Irving, MLA King South. Good morning, Brennan McGuire, MLA Halifax Atlantic. Thank you very much. So our first presenter is Professor Sheila Wildman. Welcome, Sheila. So the floor is yours, uh, 10 minutes, and then we'll have some questions for you. All right, and if I don't keep my eye on the clock, please just stop me at 10 so that I can hear back from you. Um, so I teach administrative law and public law at Dalhousie Schuler School of Law, and I've written about consent and capacity law. Um, and I'm honored to be the first to speak to the new uh, bill to replace the Incompetent Persons Act. I'm currently involved, I should say as well, in a, a project out of Ireland uh, in which disability rights advocates, uh, persons who've been subject to guardianship, and academics like me are reflecting together on the human rights implications of laws that remove decision-making authority from the individual. And we're thinking about the prospects for alternative models, prioritizing decision-making supports. My co-author in the paper we're writing for the book on this project, uh, and my friend, Rusi Stanev, uh, who passed away in March, was under guardianship for much of his life. And he memorably said, um, on fighting his guardianship and his institutionalization before the European Court of Human Rights, he said, I'm a person, not an object. I need my freedom. He said those simple words, and they've been reset by many people uh, in his uh, name and in his honor, and it's in honor of that basic insight that I make this presentation to you today. So, um, this bill represents very important steps toward realization of the liberty and equality rights of persons with disabilities in Nova Scotia, but I'm going to use the little time I have to emphasize um, the miles to go, some ways that we can go further, um, both in law and in practice. So I was last here addressing the Accessibility Act, and I want to um, emphasize, as the Nova Scotia and Canadian Associations for Community Living have done in their joint press release last week, I want to emphasize this bill is, or should be, on its application, <laughs> and at its core, it should be about accessibility. So to be human rights respecting, this law and its implementation must be centered in the idea of accommodation of disability, and so enabling decision-making on a model of accommodation or provision of supports. That should be the first line of inquiry when faced with prospective legal incapacity. Not what's wrong with you, what are your deficits, let's record them and you know, tabulate them, but how can we support you in making decisions for yourself, and so in being the author of your own life. 
Um, so, as the joint press release states, the bill should ensure that people are able to maximize their decision-making capacity. Specifically, and here's where the bill falls short, and you'll hear from others on this, um, again, lots of good to say about the law, but specifically the law should recognize a duty to provide reasonable accommodations in the decision-making process. So in the process of demonstrating adequacy to the standard and in um, making decisions uh, more generally. This is a state duty and it should be facilitated wherever persons with disabilities interact with capacity assessors or service providers, um, as well as informing the work of appointed representatives. I also support the call in the Nova Scotia and Canadian Association for Community Living press release for the act to designate a hub, a, an independent institutional hub responsible for providing independent advocacy and rights advice and for otherwise facilitating decision making supports including access to communication intermediaries and other accommodations, and as the press release says, support network development. You can't leave persons whose legal capacity is under suspicion or scrutiny to their own resources in protecting or reclaiming the rights, that the fundamental rights that this law removes. And we learned that from Landon Webb's case. I'm not sure we fully addressed that in the new law that we've, uh, we've um, put forward. Um, finally, I agree that the Act should recognize supported decision-making as a valid alternative, um, allowing appointment of a, support, uh, of a supporter. So I've prepared a written statement and a summary of my main points, including the main recommendations that I've made, and I handed around a kind of short version of that. Um, and again, at the heart of the recommendations is this idea of accommodation of disability and so more clearly instituting a duty to support decision-making. Um, I do say a little bit on process as well, and I'm, I'm putting aside, you know, taking the time to congratulate government and talk about how far we've come from the old law. That I'm just, I'm, I'm taking as a given. Um, but in terms of the process of law reform in this case, I argue and I, I substantiate this in the, in the um, written materials I provided. Government, although government did all right, um, especially at the end of the process, um, could have done better in meeting the democratic and human rights requirements to ensure full and effective participation of persons with disabilities in uh, matters affecting them and in particular matters of public policy and law. So while government representatives were respectful and receptive in the meetings that I knew of or participated in, um, intensive and responsive stakeholder meetings began, began far too late in late summer and so took place in a very pressured environment that didn't allow for adequate canvassing or expression of views. And in particular, I would argue that too little was done to locate persons directly affected by the bill, persons under guardianship, and to ensure that their voices were heard. Um, and that's, that's a human rights problem. Beyond those problems with consultation, I had the further concern in my document that's brought out in the larger process um, of Canada's meeting its obligations under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So just a moment of background to this. Um, at the center of human rights developments around legal capacity and decision making internationally is Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, and that, that article is titled equal, equal Recognition Before the Law. And it requires state parties, among other things, requires state parties to take appropriate measures to provide access by persons with disabilities to the supports they may require to exercise legal capacity. So Canada, while it's ratified the CRPD in 2010, made a declaration reserving its right to maintain current regimes of what are called substitute decision making, it's contrasted with supported. The CRPD committee, in its recent April 2017 concluding observations on Canada's report on its obligations under the CRPD, it recommended that Canada withdraw its reservation and carry out a federal, provincial, territorial process in consultation with persons with disabilities to bring its laws into line with the Convention and particularly with Article 12. I understand the federal government has already initiated a process in this regard with a meeting scheduled for later this year. So just to pull back on process and come to a point, 
Um, I would argue that in light of the problems with consultation and this imminent process of federal, provincial, territorial review in light of the CRPD, that a provision should be added to this bill requiring mandatory review of the Act within a specific period while committing to a further robust, inclusive consultation process. And I would add that there should be a commitment specifically to consult on and introduce a supported decision-making regime. So the rest of my submissions, I've got two minutes left, thank you. The substantive part of my submissions that I detail in what I, uh, what I gave you um, address ways that respect for liberty and equality um, must be understood as mutually determining, mutually constitutive in this um, law. And I argue that the bill in various ways fails to recognize that the necessary complement to the principle of least restriction on liberty, the principle at the center of this bill, um, is a duty to provide supports to enable equal access to liberty and so to rights of self-determination. And so on specific areas of the bill that I would suggest could be improved if you were to take it back and do some you know, uh, tweaks and certainly look forward to a, a longer consultation and reform process in future. Um, I endorse recommendations from Professor Kaiser, including his suggested preamble. I note the tantalizing mention of supports in parts of the bill, including the definition section, but the failure to anchor anywhere in the bill a duty to provide supports, whether in the assessment of capacity or on behalf of, on the part of service providers um, uh, or otherwise. Um, the most important final recommendations I go I make uh, go to the need for mandatory reporting and other oversight mechanisms to ensure that the law is being complied with, provision of state-funded counsel, and I would say this is constitutionally required in this setting, um, and also provision, as has been made in Ireland's new law on legal capacity, as I said earlier, provision for an independent institutional hub, and I would say it should be devoted to research and public education on supported decision making. We need to affect a cultural and paradigm shift toward accommodations, and you can't do that by the words on paper on a law. So this is why I think it's so important to create this kind of institutional hub <clears throat> devoted, as I said, to research, public education on supported decision making, um, and also devoted to provision of advocacy supports, complaints investigation, um, and auditing. Um, very last thing, I would argue that this is just the first step of what should be many steps in Nova Scotia to revisiting laws that affect the fundamental liberty and equality rights of persons with intellectual, psychosocial, and other cognitive disabilities in the province. So a whole suite of our laws, from from the Adult Protection Law, to our IPTA Law, to the Personal Directives Act, um, all in recognition of the ways that respect for liberty fundamentally implicates a duty to provide supports to enable equal enjoyment of liberty. And in particular, this work should take us back to the roadmap, <laughs> and so back to the work of reforming law and policy relating to disability supports in order to better reflect and coordinate respect for equality uh, and liberty, um, uh, and the right to live in community on equal terms. All right, thanks. <clears throat> thank you. I'll let you go over just a little bit. I'm sure oh, they didn't mind. Thank you very no, much, you yeah. did an excellent job there. Ms. McFarland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for coming in and speaking with us. Um, in second reading, I mentioned about a hub as well. Um, I think the bill is a good start. I think that there could be amendments, and I think that as you speak about the process that perhaps it was a little rush. I know that they were still meeting with stakeholders that I think the day before it was actually introduced, but I think we have to have a better understanding of what a hub looks like and what department that would fall under, what would be the cost of having a hub. I agree there needs to be more um, advocacy and opportunity for people to go and be, help me navigate it through the process. So can you just elaborate a little bit more on what you think a hub looks like? Yeah, and, um, and uh, again, I'd point you to Ireland, which has actually um, instituted in its new act, it had an act, uh, I think, Legal Capacity 2015, someone else will remember the name, I have it in the document that I gave you, um, it actually institutes um, a supported decision-making hub agency, it's got a 
uh, I don't have the name of it right here. Um, and so if you can go on the web and look at that, they're in process, as I understand it, of designing it and giving it content. So they're undertaking that very exploration now. Um, but all of the things that I mentioned, so responsibility for research and public education, as well as investigation of complaints, um, resides in that hub and my understanding of such a such an institution would be that it's not built just to respond to people who are under guardianship or who are you know otherwise involved with the act it's meant to um, enable alternatives to guardianship or to uh, any kind of you know uh, legal representation of one person by another so in terms of where it would reside here in Nova Scotia big question you know some folks might say well put it under the public trustee because the public trustee is already doing oversight of guardianships. Bit of a concern about um, conflict there and independence in that the public trustee is also the representative of last resort and so to re have the hub residing there may be a problem. Uh, we have our new uh, accessibility directorate um, which is responsible for overseeing uh, you know, disability uh, related uh, issues and laws in the province. Um, whether they have the capacity as it stands to do that work is a huge question. Um, so it's it's a point to cons to consider, but that's not a reason. Uh, consider carefully, but it's not a reason not to do it. Yeah. Thank you, <clears throat> Ms. Chender. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I noted that you did discuss um, the idea of mandatory reporting and oversight as an area where this could be improved. One place that this has come up in some of the stakeholders we've spoken with is around the fact that the old orders from the Incompetent Persons Act would be grandfathered into this act. So you didn't mention that directly, but I wonder um, what your sense of the best way to deal with that would be, because I know that there are some serious concerns about that. Yeah, and it's it's in my um, submission, and I'm so glad you mentioned it, because in terms of the, the flaws of the act, that's a glaring one. Um, so it's a real problem that Section 73 of the Act effectively grandfathers existing orders. And act, again, as I was thinking about this, I looked to Ireland's law. I'm not saying that their law is one that we should, um, you know, model ours on in every respect. It's called, by the way, the Assisted Decision Making Bracket Capacity Act 2015. Um, but that act requires review of all existing guardianships to either discharge the adults affected as occurred in Landon Webb's case, say, um, or to assist in the transition to the new regime. So it puts, as I understand it, the onus on government to reach out and find <laughs> and inform uh, and do the work to ensure that those unconstitutional orders and guardianships that were implemented under them are actually brought into line with, with the new reality. It's, it's a serious problem to just leave them untouched. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could we have a copy of your submission also for the record? Yes, I think I gave it to somebody. And That's the full, okay. Well, no, there's not, uh, there's actually a full one that is all of 12 pages. So I can leave it here. We can make a copy if you'd like to. Yeah. Get it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Thanks. Wendy Lill. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you. So the floor is yours, 10 minutes for a presentation and five minutes for questions. Lovely, I have a, I have a presentation, I, I made four copies and then my printer ran out of ink, so I'll leave it to um, someone else. We can else make copies, Lovely. thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm, my name is Wendy Lill, it's an honour to be here today to speak to the Committee on Bill 16, the Adult Capacity and Decision Making Act. It's an important bill and it's a cornerstone of legislation guiding our treatment and care of persons with disabilities, as well as those who may be experiencing limitations at times in their lives. I'm here as a member of Community Homes Action Group, concerned citizens, healthcare professionals, and parents advocating for better residential options for persons with disabilities. I'm also here as the mother of a young adult with developmental disabilities. I've been thinking about uh, the issues of capacity and independence and the quality of life for a long time, 32 years actually. How do we make sure that people we love and ones we don't love and don't know um, are able to live independently and make decisions on their own? 
How do we accommodate them? The goal is not to take over their decision making, but just to make it easier. The fact is, it's almost always easier to just take charge of things, make decisions for someone, than taking the time to really discern someone's wishes. It's a constant struggle to figure this out. Are we controlling lives or enabling them to people to live in their potential? That is surely what the concept of human rights is all about. That is what uh, this bill must be about, Bill 16. From 1997 to, 90, to 2004, while the Member of Parliament for Dartmouth, I was on the Disability Subcommittee of the House of Commons. I had the opportunity to interact with many individuals and, pro and organizations working to strengthen federal legislation, programs, and services for this population. The duty to accommodate was a, was a central issue addressed at the federal level. It was a red letter day in 2010 when the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the UNCRPD, as it's known, was ratified by Canada with the full support of the government of Nova Scotia to ensure people with access to the supports and accommodations they need to enhance and exercise their decision-making capacity. In 2013, I co-chaired the Roadmap Committee the committee mandated by the Minister of Community Services to develop a roadmap for transforming Nova Scotia's services for persons with disabilities. And that was guided, our process was all guided by the UN Convention. In our work we found that many people with significant intellectual, cognitive and mental health disabilities were being restricted in making decisions to a much greater degree than was necessary Service provisions in the disability and older adult sector is often based on the assumption that because people need supports and care, others should make decisions on their behalf. Our committee found that Nova Scotia needed as a much more robust legal framework for supported decisions that would provide people and families with the means to enhance capacity. We recommended legislative reform immediately to ensure compliance with the UNCRPD on several acts, in particular reforms to the Incompetent Persons Act and the Adult Protection Act. That was 2013. It's now 2017. It has been extremely frustrating to see the sluggish pace of change on all of these important pieces of legislation. Fortunately, in 2016, the Nova Scotia Supreme Court struck down the Incompetent Persons Act calling on the government to address the human rights violations in the law, thereby kick-starting this important changes, the changes needed, which brings us here today, Bill 16. There are concerns about Bill 16 that need to be addressed before the law, become, before it becomes law, but I believe there exists the will and the expertise to bring that about. I've read some of the excellent speeches in the legislature, um, legislature at second reading. I've read their submissions by Professor Archie Kaiser, and as well as the brief from the Nova Scotia Association of Community Living and the Canadian Association of Community Living. There are le legal and human rights experts in this room today who will provide you with chapter and verse on areas of this legislation needing work, and, I, and also, I hope, clear recommendations on how to improve the bill. I will leave the heavy lifting to them. But I would like to address a couple of things. I've heard the argument such as, I've heard the argument as it stands now, that the bill is a start. It's better than the last bill. It doesn't have to be perfect. We should just get the thing out the door and smooth the edges later. That's absolutely the wrong view. From our work on the roadmap, we know there are several interrelated, act, interrelated acts that guide the lives and welfare of people with disabilities. It's like laying a foundation for a house. Each piece needs to fit together. You can't have a solid house if there are flaws in the foundation. People and organizations I respect say the building blocks are flawed. If this act is flawed, then the other acts also attached to it can't help but be flawed and we'll be building a structure which won't stand the test of time, nor the strong and inevitable winds of a legal challenge in the future. 
I've also heard the comment that Bill 16 isn't really central to anything, that it would really impact only the lives of a few. In fact, the opposite is the case. I would say this act is foundational for all of us in the future, for moms of 32-year-old sons with disabilities or 32-month-old sons, to your mothers and fathers or spouses who may find themselves with diminished capacity at some point in their lives. We may all be subjected to this law, and let's hope it's a good one. We need to get it right. The Canadian Association of Community Living and its provincial branch have stated Bill 16 neither meets the court challenges to clear up its human rights violations, nor the requirement to the CRPD to ensure people have access to the supports and ac accommodations they need to enhance and exercise their decision-making capacity. At present, Bill 16 is mute when it comes to the actual mechanisms by which supported decision-making will take place and what role and responsibility the state has. Article 12.3 of the UNCRPD states, parties to the convention have an obligation to ensure people have access to the supports they need to exercise their legal capacity. Bill 16 recognizes no such obligation the absence of which leaves such grandiose phrases as promoting dignity, autonomy, and freedom of decision-making empty indeed. So we need to correct this. Before closing, I'd like to address one more refrain I've heard about Bill 16, and that is, it's too late to do more. The deadline placed by the Supreme Court can't be changed. The bill must be passed now. To that, I would simply say, if the Supreme Court is made aware the drafters of the bill need more time to work, in conjunction with legal and human rights representatives from the community to meet its stated goals, which are to correct the human rights violations within the Act, why on earth would it not be willing to grant an extension? Why on earth would the court not accommodate this request? There are concerns with the bill that need to be addressed before it becomes law. I urge people of good faith, both from government and community, to come together quickly and effectively to make this happen on behalf of our citizens with disabilities. Thank you for your attention and interest in creating quality legislation for our province. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. I appreciate your presentation. If we could have a copy of that also. That'd Absolutely, I have. Ms. Chender. Uh, I just wanted to also thank you, uh, Wendy, on behalf of uh, all of us for coming to speak. I think you probably have as much knowledge on this topic as uh, most of us in this room combined. Um, I just, uh, I wanted to ask about the roadmap. Um, as you pointed out, uh, and I have to confess I'm not as familiar with it as I should be. So as you pointed out, we, we've gotten to this place really only because this moved through the courts uh, and the Supreme Court struck down the act. Um, are there other uh, legislative projects that we should be working on right now in tandem with this? And, and, and what's your sense of how we're moving through this roadmap? Uh, I th thank you for the question. Uh, there, are, there is a whole uh, suite of um, legislations that need to be addressed, and I was sort of hoping you wouldn't ask me that question because <laughs> I can't give you the shopping list, but there are probably about eight or nine laws that are all interacting um, are, that, and do govern the lives of people with disabilities. Certainly the uh, central ones are the Incompetent Persons Act, right. um, the Adult Protection Act, uh, the Homes for Special Care Act, um, and there are, again, s several others. Okay. And yes, they, they all have to be uh, grounded in um, the United Nations uh, uh, Convention. Mm -hmm. and, um, and clearly, um, we have to make sure that there, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no distance between those, um, those foundations. Right. We have to make sure. So maybe just to get a little more specific, I know yes. that the big issue here is around Article 12 of the UNCRPD yes. and the one that we currently have a reservation to in terms of supported decision making. Are there other acts that implicate that specifically? I would say that um, 
uh, certainly the um, Adult Protection Act, uh -huh. uh, and I would also uh, say the um, Homes for Special Care Act. Thank that you. I would, uh, yes, for cer certainly those two. Thanks. And perhaps, um, I, I'm not sure whether anybody else speaking here could address that at this moment, but I'm sure, certainly I'm sure uh, um, some of the people who, who have made submissions can, can speak to that technicality or more to that. Thank you. And uh, even though, you know, you, you leave the session, um, you know how to get a hold of each other, hopefully, and maybe some information can be passed that way also. Okay. That'd be appreciated. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Charlie McDonald. Okay, uh, very good, thank you. Thank you very much. Not a problem whatsoever, no. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, Charlie. So you know the procedure, the, the floor is yours, you have 10 minutes. Uh, thank you very much and uh, I'm here representing the uh, Nova Scotia Association for Community Living. Unfortunately, Carmel Times was originally... Just, excuse, just one minute, um, I believe your mic hasn't started yet. We'll wait for Hanser to... They'll... they'll so, there we go. Okay. And, okay. and I'm going to start your time over all. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, I'm here. Originally, I had been down as a, a private citizen presentation, but due to uh, the chair of the Nova Scotia Association for Community Living is unavailable suddenly, yeah. I'm here to represent their joint, their joint submission uh, with the Canadian Association for Community Living and the Institute for Research and Development on Inclusive Communities, and Michael Bach. Uh, joins me at the table uh, in that respect, so it is a joint uh, submission, and uh, we have copies to provide if you want us to pass them around. Uh, we could do that, uh, and it's, it certainly is a, a, a pleasure for us to come here and, and present um, the perspective of the associations and IRIS uh, with respect to this very important legislation. I should also give kudos to the, uh, actually to the Accessibility uh, Act and the folks at the Accessibility Office, because as I showed up here this morning, I was sitting here and someone came running up and said, um, oh, by the way, I'm from the Accessibility Office. Is there any support you need to allow you to participate in this session? And sometimes support can be that simple, uh, to allow folks uh, who are autonomous citizens uh, to engage in the political uh, process. So uh, certainly kudos and thank you to the office for, for that offer. Um, we're here to uh, provide um, information from our perspective as an association of families and individuals with intellectual disabilities. Um, we foster and, and try to um, build full citizenship, uh, human rights and inclusion for folks with intellectual disabilities. That's the essence of all our, all our three organizations. Uh, in review of the um, of the legislation and the process for um, developing the legislation, we have some certain, certain concerns that the legislation really does not address the issues facing adults with intellectual disabilities, particularly with respect to their autonomy, the security of their person, and their liberty, liberty and rights as a citizen of Canada. So it's an extremely important uh, piece of legislation that has major impacts on the lives of Nova Scotians so it does, it, it does behoove us to take most care in, in this legislation. The Incompetent Persons Act, I don't know how far back it goes, but once it's enacted, it's gonna be in here for a long time. And I guess this time of year, I should quote Yogi Berra uh, in saying, don't be in a hurry to lose. Uh, so, and, and I know it has been brought up earlier that what, whereas the court has, has suggested that this be done by December 28th or whatever, that. Uh, surely they would uh, recognize the need to collaborate, communicate, and engage with a, a community that over the period of their history has been stigmatized, labeled, uh, and forgotten, and, and had things done for them over the years. So that's just a, a, a cautionary note. Um, 
As you can see in the paper, there are several areas in the legislation that are of concern to the associations. Certainly, they, that, that they are not compliant, the legislation is not compliant with the uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and as Ms. Mrs. Lills indicated, uh, choices, good lives, and inclusive communities, the roadmap, uh, and the directions that the roadmap map developed uh, some three or four years ago now. So that is of concern. Uh, another concern is, is a rather vague and arbitrary definition of capacity uh, that can really provide arbitrary um, impacts on individuals with uh, intellectual disabilities. The um, lack of a timely and a reasonable accommodation for supports uh, to allow individuals to make decisions on their own behalf is, 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 is an issue, particularly with the human rights of those individuals. And again, the legislation, while it identifies the need for supports in decision making, really doesn't go the next step in saying, here's how we can support and provide supports uh, for individuals who need that, that help. Uh, certainly, uh, due process for those that are grandparented in is, is not uh, taken into account in the legislation and is of concern to the associations. Um, certainly, the, in, the allowing of invasive procedures, whether it be extraction of tissue or some other invasive practice that is allowed through the legislation is of concern. Uh, certainly, the, the need for uh, some oversight uh, of the individuals who are empowered to make decisions on behalf of individuals is, is a major concern. Uh, so, as you'll see in the document, there's, a, there's an array of a certain concerns of the document, and this association with the support of IRIS and CACL has come up with a seven point recommendations uh, to alleviate those concerns in the legislation. Um, certainly, um, uh, they, will addre they address the issues of being compliant with the convention, uh, being more engaged with the community to a, a real consultation, uh, providing the, the supports and backups that people need to make, make decisions. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Bach, who will lead you through uh, those seven recommendations. Thank My, you. Michael, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, members, for the opportunity uh, to be here. Um, I've had the honor of working with our colleagues in the Nova Scotia uh, Association as well as our associations across the country, formerly as the Executive Vice President of the Canadian Association for Community Living for 15 years and now as Managing Director of, of IRIS. I've, I, I think it's important to recognize that there's a lot of reference and talk about supported decision making. This goes back a very long way in the Canadian context. The Canadian Association for Community Living in 1991 put together a task force on alternatives to guardianship because People First of Canada and its member associations at its first uh, uh, general uh, assembly in 1991 called for an end to guardianship laws in Canada because they undermined the, the autonomy rights of people with disabilities and instead advocated for a framework for supported decision making. So we been in this discussion for 25 years in Canada. In the interim, uh, CACL and our members led in negotiations at the UN to get Article 12 included in the Convention, and we were really honoured and pleased to see that. And at IRIS, we've been uh, privileged to be consulting with governments and civil society groups uh, around the world in, how, in, in terms of how to implement um, uh, a supported decision making and the right to legal capacity. I think the starting point for our comments this, this morning are to applaud the government for the promises that it makes to, to, to Nova Scotians, and, and in particular to people with, with intellectual disabilities and cognitive disabilities. So there, there are promises made that I think the government should be a proud of and that, that are proud of and that are applauded uh, in the community. The, the problem is that the measures in the legislation won't deliver on the promises. Uh, and um, in, in that regard, will fail to protect the Section 7 Charter, uh, Section 7 Charter rights of people with disabilities. And I'd like to, to begin by referring back to the Supreme Court decision that struck down the law in the first place. In paragraph 19, the court in its decision writes, Section 7 of the Charter permits interference with liberty and security only where the law does not violate principles of fundamental justice. Laws that do that 
cannot be arbitrary or overbroad and cannot have consequences that are grossly disproportionate to their ob object. The court struck down the law in the context of the Incompetent Persons Act, which had one object that the court recognized, which was to protect persons who were found to have uh, impairment of mental capacity. The, what, what's, what's really important about the new act is that it expands the statutory objects in very important ways to protect the autonomy, uh, uh, decision-making of, 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 of all persons, to, um, to ensure that any measures that would restrict liberty um, uh, uh, do so um, only as the very uh, last alternative, that, any, that less intrusive measures, less restrictive measures are explored and uh, uh, exhausted before any uh, guardianship order is implemented. So the court set a really high bar for the legislation. The new legislation meets that bar in terms of its promises, but fails in its measures. Uh, and I want to point to uh, some some very some specific ways highlighted by Charlie and previous pre presenters that um, uh, I, I think um, want to put on some t the table some specific recommendations that would address those issues. So one of the areas is definition of capacity. Uh, what's really important about the legislation and the definition of capacity is that it acknowledges that people can exercise capacity with support. So, th so for the first time it acknowledges that even though a person may have an impairment, to use the language of, of the Act, um, that that can be accommodated with support. But it doesn't go on to specify at all what that support would be. And, and so that's, as Charlie says, that leaves wide scope for arbitrary application of a definition of capacity. So in our recommendations, and their um, uh, detail on these in this statutory framework for a model legal capacity and supported decision-making act uh, are, are detailed in there. But um, in summary, what, what, they, what, what it would mean is that we would recognize that capacity resides, A, in the adult, him or herself, with supports as they may be needed and accommodations for, from others so that they can make decisions by themselves. Or B, uh, within the understanding and appreciation of the decision-making supporters that are duly appointed to support that person in exercising power over their own lives on the basis of that person's will and preferences. So we acknowledge that there will be people who cannot make decisions on their own by themselves, consent on their own. But to, to make guardianship the only response and not to acknowledge that people can be supported, that their will can be interpreted into healthcare decisions, into property decisions, with a group of, dis, uh, of supporters who would be required under the legislation to meet their fiduciary duty of the individual, to only act for the sole benefit of that individual, not to provide that opportunity doesn't meet the test, we would argue, of the court in Webb. It provides for arbitrary and overbroad responses to what is a situation of lack of support. Um, uh, Professor Wildman has spoken to, about the duty to accommodate as, as others have. The, 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 the statute, by only providing for appointment of guardians, leaves the second to last resort uh, unspecified, right? So if guardianship is in fact going to be the last resort, what's the least restrictive alternative? It's, it's left in very vague terms as well. If you have support, well, then maybe it'll work out. We would propose instead, and we've got provisions um, proposed in our, our draft statute that would provide for people to appoint their decision-making supporters. Decision-making supporters don't remove from me my legal person and vest it in another th authority, as a representative would do under this act. It allows me to appoint people who are going to provide provide me support. Duly specified people, on the, uh, individuals on the basis of personal knowledge, trust and commitment, where people are not able to make that appointment, and that those provisions are provided in the Irish legislation, it's provided in the BC Representation Act, it's provided in, in, in legislation in, in three or four other jurisdictions in Canada already, and, and increasingly in jurisdictions around the world. But where a person isn't able to meet the test for appointment, um, even let's say a lower threshold for what we might now have for appointing powers of attorney. Decision-making supporters could be applied to be a, uh, appointed, possibly through a revised public trustee's office, a legal capacity and support office, or maybe to the court. 
uh, to be recognized as people who will provide that support on the basis that they have a relationship of personal knowledge, trust, and commitment. Again, there are ways of doing this. We have research and knowledge and examples around the, the country. Um, another area that we think is critically important is to require that alternative courses of action are in fact explored before liberty rights are removed. If we don't provide proactive measures, we don't meet the test that the court uh, establishes in Webb. So we need to guarantee access to a process for exploring alternative courses of action. Uh, we, we recommend, and this was uh, in Professor Wildman's presentation, uh, reference to the I Ireland um, uh, example, that the, minister, that the legislation would provide for the minister responsible for community services to designate community agencies that could provide those supports. People need a place in their community where they can go to get assistance in putting a network of support, in helping people understand their roles and responsibilities as decision-making supporters, to assist physicians in understanding what their duty to accommodate actually means and to help mediate conflicts and difficulties in a, in, in a particular situation. Uh, but you need, you, need, you need that capacity in the community to deliver. We would also suggest that in the capacity assessment process, capacity assessors be required as part of the capacity assessment to examine whether supports are in place sufficient to address the impairment and capacity that an individual has or if they could be put in place. If the test is this has to be a least alternative, a last alternative, surely capacity assessment isn't about assessing my particular cognitive functions. It's partly that. But it should also be assessing the support environment. Is it in place? Could it be put into place? What, what would it take? And the court also should be required to have that evidence before it. If it's going to remove the liberty rights of individuals, there must be evidence on the table that support options have been exhausted. And that is not currently in the Act. Um, and finally, uh, to, as, as others have said, uh, more time is needed. Uh, to do this, given the high bar that the court has uh, set for charter compliant legislation, and others have said for CRPD compliant legislation, we would we would argue that more time is needed, and certainly in the regulatory authority provided to the minister, that the process of regulatory development, given how uh, the impact that regulations will have on the liberty rights of individuals, that that process. Uh, by law, require the engagement of civil society organizations and experts uh, and, and a thorough review of, of regulations that would be required and to the greatest extent possible, we should not be putting into, into the regulatory realm those basic provisions should, that should in fact be in the statute. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. McFarlane. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thanks so much, Charlie and Michael. Um, I know that you both have an extensive amount of uh, wisdom and knowledge surrounding this, and I agree, Michael, with your comments. We should applaud the government. It's, you know, we're here, and, and there's things that can be added to this. I even somewhat believe that maybe we can get it right before the deadline, to be honest, because I think it's so articulated well what we have to do. But I notice under um, <clears throat> the legal recognition and provision for making uh, supported decision making arrangements. In particular, I, my question is though, uh, I see that we're making reference to BC, we're making reference to Ontario, we're making reference to different provinces. Is there one in particular province though that has it right? That we as legislators can, can go home this evening and read their uh, piece of legislation on it? Or is it going to be something that we're going to have to pick from different provinces and morph something together that will be right for the province of Nova Scotia? Uh, we've had a legal expert review provisions in jurisdictions across Canada, and ideally you'd pull from bits and pieces. Uh, I would suggest, so that, though, that the BC representation agreement gets closest with one really important distinction. So the BC representation agreement act provides that decision-making supporters can be um, appointed based uh, on the, the presence of a trusting relationship between the individual and supporter. That's the bottom line threshold. And that the obligation is on the other party to prove that the person doesn't even have that in place, right? 
the problem, I think, with the, the legislation is that it leaves up to decision-making supporters whether they'll act in a substitute capacity or in a support capacity. It leaves that discretion open, and we think that um, would, does not meet the, uh, the, 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 the a Section 7 test, that it, it's just too arbitrary. I'm, I'm supporting someone, and today, I, you know, I'm just tired. We're going to make, this is what we're going to do, without requiring that I continue to try and understand and, 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 and support decision-making as opposed to be a substitute. So I'd use the test of capacity in the BC Representation Agreement Act, but require that you're either a supporter or in a last resort you're appointed as a, a, a guardian. Mr. McDonald, I didn't know if you were interested in speaking on that also, but I did notice you were engaged. So, uh, Mr. McDonald. Well, um, well, actually, I defer to, to Michael on this. Uh, Iris has done, has done the research, the cross-jurisdictional cross research that uh, we rely on as a, as a small association. So, I, I would defer to Michael's response on that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, and thank you both for uh, your presentations. I was wondering if, um, and this might be too long for the time we have allotted, but if you could, you know, um, in, a, in a quick way, um, take us through uh, in, a, in either with someone that you actually know, or you can make up the story based on all of the people that you've encountered in this work. Um, if the if the act as present was left to to be passed uh, with none of the recommendations, I'm hearing that obviously there's a ton of more work to do. Uh, what would that what, take us through a day in the life of a person and how that would affect them? And conversely, if uh, these recommendations were allowed to be made and the act was gone back for much more work, and uh, take us through like so basically, I'm asking you a worst case scenario and a best case scenario in the day. Of, of a life of somebody. Mr. Bach. Thank you. Um, let, me, let me speak. There, there are many families, including Wendy Lil, who, who shared her story here this morning, who could, who could also answer this question. I'd like to draw an example from Ontario, which has not put in place supported decision making. You can look up Rebecca Bayani, B E A Y N I, on the web. She has a website. She spoke at the United Nations uh, in support of Article 12 with her mother. Rebecca has a significant intellectual disability and cerebral palsy and is able to communicate only in ways that her support network understands. She has particular ways of verbalizing and gesture. Uh, Rebecca is a painter. She, has a, a, she uses a, head, a, a headlamp and she will point to a, a the, with her painting support people, a color on the palette and a, a canvas and move her head and they follow. Uh, Rebecca is a member of her faith community and, she, and, 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 dan and part of the dance troupe. Um, because supported decision making is not provided in that uh, jurisdiction, uh, her family felt that if, if the parents were to pass, they would want to make sure that property issues were dealt with and she could inherit the state um, and that they could have some control over that. Um, but because there wasn't provisions for supported decision making, they had to go and apply for guardianship. They put the application in, and Rebecca and her family are fine with me sharing this story. Um, and the, the application said, well, who, you know, who's Rebecca? You know, you know, what's the assessment of her capacity, et cetera? They wrote the first story about Rebecca, and the social worker or lawyer said, oh, whoa, 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 you're never gonna get guardian, you're never, you're, 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 you're never gonna get guardianship for Rebecca, because look, she's a member of a faith community. She's a painter. She has all these friends and family. She's doing, all, she worked also at a daycare, because she had support around her. Because it wasn't available, they had to rewrite the story of Rebecca. Rebecca has the mental age of this. She's incredibly deficient in that. She's abnormal this way and that way. They had to write Rebecca into the world in a way that justified the removal of her personhood and the vesting of it in her family. It was the hardest thing her family ever did. And you'll hear from families in this province, and I had the opportunity to, to assist in the roadmap process, families simply want their family members and people with disabilities want to be recognized as people first. With support, certainly, but as mem full members of the community. Some will say, oh, and a lawyer, what some legal experts have said to me, Michael, it doesn't matter. They're profoundly intellectually disabled. They're not going to know whether they have legal capacity or not. And I'll say, and I think those in this room who, kn who know people will say, it absolutely matters because it shapes how society views a person. They'll view it. You view someone through the lens of guardianship, that means they are not, and they do not have equal legal capacity. 
right? So it matters fundamentally for people because it shapes how they're going to be known in society. And when people are not known as equal, they're subject to violence. Any reason, any wonder why people with intellectual disabilities are four times more likely to be victims of violence, four times more likely to die preventable deaths, it's because they're not seen as equal. If you're vulnerable in society because you're not viewed and supported as equal, you, uh, uh, you, you suffer that kind of harm. That's why this issue, and excuse me for my passion on this, but this, <laughs> it's why this issue is so fundamental to our movement because we know the difference that, that it can make, and, and families across the country tell us the harm that it causes when they have to remove legal personhood from their family members. All we're asking is to recognize support, and that, and as the court said in Webb, that, that there is nuance here. There isn't one solution, right? And uh, so we would really in, encourage uh, that, that, that members understand that at, at rock bottom, this is about how people are, are seen in the world, and it matters how you're seen in the world. Thank you, Mr. Bach. You should never have to apologize in this room for passion. <laughs> okay, appreciate it. I, I couldn't improve on that answer if I tried. Ch Mr. McDonald, oh, yes, certainly. I, I couldn't improve on that answer if I tried, but, but the question does raise the issue about hearing first voice, about hearing, having a process where folks can inform this legislation in a safe and supported way. And you'd hear those stories across the province uh, if they're if, given the supports and availability and the time uh, to engage in a process that, that folks can inform this legislation. You, you know, it's very complex legislation. It's very complex to under, understand. For me, it was very complex to even find a, a, a bloody copy of it on the website. <laughs> so, and, and if you're not versed in law, et cetera, et cetera. So let's hear from the first voice. Uh, on, on this, and, and, and your, your questions will be answered. Mr. McDonald, Mr. Mr. Um, Bach, uh, thank you very much. Very, uh, thank you. Very good presentation. Next, we have Brenda Webb. Brenda, yes. Ms. Webb, welcome. Any chair, to whichever, center stage is good. <laughs> Thank you. So we have, we have 10 minutes for presentation and five minutes for a question. The, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I am pleased to see that the new Adult Capacity and Decision-Making Act is nearing completion. I think you have got some things right, allowing for alternative guardians and joint guardians. A person can apply for guardianship before a person is 18. A representative can apply to the court for directions, section 61. Although there are safeguards under the Act, it is very difficult for the person to navigate the legal system. There is a lack of support and assistance and inadequate financial assistance to hire a lawyer. Other than the Act saying a person with disability has a right to a lawyer, it does little else. <clears throat> Expecting parents as representatives to repeatedly go back to court puts undue hardship on the parents with costs making it unfair and an unequal playing field for those that cannot afford it. The law is assumptional in areas where it assumes parents have money for a lawyer or to repeatedly return to court with a lawyer time and time again. Although the government has recognized this as an issue, nothing was changed. If parents are made to go back to court all the time chasing the proverbial dog's tail, who can afford it? People can't afford it now. Who will be doing the assessment for capacity? In Ontario, physicians are trained for this. Occupational therapists, nurses, etc. should all receive training for this. Legislation comes in effect December 28th that calls for representation plans. What happens after that December 29th? 
There needs to be education across systems, particularly for service providers who routinely ignore guardianship orders now. Section 7.1. Upon hearing the application, the court may make an order appointing a representative. This needs to read shall. Section 18C, indicate, indicate in the capacity assessment report the forms of support or assistance, if any, would help the adult. The concern here is whether the adult, the assessor, would actually know what available, what's available for forms of assistance and supports. Section 4, A. An adult is entitled to make own decisions unless the adult's incapacity to do so is clearly demonstrated. B, an adult is not incapable of making decisions merely based, merely because the adult makes or would make a decision that an adult would consider risky or unwise. This has had a lot of conversation. As a parent, a young person's brain isn't fully developed until age 25. Our sons or daughters are in the reproductive years, and they are at a high risk than the general population to be manipulated, taken advantage of, and the world is a complicated place in which many are complex in. It does not sit well with me to have harm and hardship when there just needs to be common sense. Some people might think risk-taking or unwise decision-making looks and sounds good. Some refer it to the school of hard knocks. But as a society, it is our responsibility and our obligation to protect those that are vulnerable than ourselves. Section 5, where the court grants a representative for an adult authority to act and make decisions respecting with whom the adult may associate the representative may only exercise the authority to prevent the adult from associating with an individual if associating with the individual would seriously jeopardize the health and safety of the adult. It does not say what the required proof would be for this. Section 34.2, the representative for an adult may not, on behalf of the adult, A, commence divorce proceedings, are we going to discuss marriage within that realm as well? Um, section 40, number one, who will define reasonable in decision making? And will representatives constantly be dragged back to court because of this? Section 46, number one, the bond can be a big barrier for families seeking an order. Number 2A and Section 3 and 4, both being impacted and changed by the RS, RDSPs and will be hurt by this as well. Section 51, subject to the regulations on its own motion or in the application of the public trustee or any other interested person, the court may at any time order the representative to submit to the court, the public trustee, or any other person. Any other person, again, a representative, can be taken back to court because someone is meddling, doesn't understand, has their own agenda, and the cost for the representative are enormous. Section 58, one, a representative for an adult shall apply for review of the representation order. Here again, a representative could be back in court again. Number two, an adult who is the subject of a representative order, the representative for the adult or any interested person may, in accordance with the regulations, apply to the court for review of the order. Again, the representative could be facing court costs. The act allows for an abuse of power by forcing parents to walk away. Thank you for listening and for your time. Thank you very much. And if we could have a copy of your notes, there were some very good specific things. I couldn't keep up with your, with your section, Sarah. Questions? Oh. Ms. Webb, thank you very much um, for your presentation today. And uh, we'll now move on to the next speaker. Thank you.
Daryl Webb. Thank you. Can you circulate that? Welcome, Mr. Webb. Good morning. So the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes for a presentation and five minutes for questions. Okay. Take your time. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Darrell Webb, and I have, uh, I have learned disabilities. I had, I, have a chance, I had a chance to read over the new act, and I did, I did my best to read it. I can't for make head or tail of it. There are a lot of people with learning disabilities. There are a lot of other parents like me who have experience of needing an adult capacity decision making. How do, how do you expect parents to navigate this progress? Procedure, I mean. It's an, in, it's, it's entertaining. It costs, it costs for a lawyer are ridiculous. No family who have sick children and raised them could ever afford what you ask them to do. The law wants them to make their own decisions, even if they're, they're not good choices or risky ones. Somebody should walk in our shoes for a while, and you, should, you, and you would never think that way. A, par a parent wants their, their son or daughter to, to be safe. My disabilities are hard to live with. I can't imagine what it is like for someone who struggles much more than me. This law still needs some changes. No parent wants to have a guardianship. It's because they had to. It's, it's, they had to. It's had to. All parents want the best for their ch child. Making parents go back to court isn't right. Making them go back repeatedly isn't really, is really wrong. Parents don't concern, uh, for concern, it's a, it's a burden. They concern, it's their obligation to care for their child because they love them. A law like this should be wrote much more simpler because of the people you were dealing with in respect of will never be able to afford the hoops and loops that are in this new act. Persons with disabilities didn't ask to be born this way. It's hard enough to live in this world. Never mind with, disabil with disabilities, if you protect them from their actions, they would be harmed or dead because of their actions. There are some individuals who are born with, brain with birth injuries, lack of auctions at birth because of others' mistakes, and those people and their families live with that the rest of their lives. People that are writing this act don't know what it's like to go through life with a child or children with disabilities or illness. It's hard on marriages, financial, difficult, and it's, it's a lifelong commitment of concern and worry. And your your hearts and you have some of the greatest experience of your life. Until you lived the life you couldn't possibly understand. We live in a troubled wor world. Many will not have the capacity to understand the consequence of their actions. This bill will remain in place for a very long time. So you need to take everything in consideration because it affects people daily lives every day. Thank you for letting me speak today. Mr. Webb, thank you for speaking today. Ms. McFarland has a question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Daryl and Brenda, I want to thank you for being here today. Um, I have followed your story from mm -hmm. the beginning. And I want to say that the documentary through Fifth Estate really, really tugged at my heart. I sat on the couch and I cried. And 
I think I left with one powerful thing, though, and that was that you love your son. Oh, yeah. You love your son so much, and every action and every step you took was in his best interest. Yep. And sadly, the law lacks. And we have to get it right. We have to get it right. And if there was one in particular thing, I mean, the act is hard for anyone to read and to understand. We could take hours and read them, and then as legislators, we're comparing and we're trying to figure it out. So if there was one thing you would ask of us that would make it easier, I know there's a number of things, but if there was one in particular thing, would it be to have a hub or more resources for families like yourself to be able to tap into to help navigate the system? Yes, it would be. Yes. Mr. Webb, Thank also you. on behalf of the committee, I appreciate uh, you, you and Brenda's bringing the human aspect here to, to it is, uh, is important and it's appreciated and your courage in that effect is, is well recognized. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Dave Kent. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. I see you have, have uh, it's a tag team, that's good to see. Yeah, Is there anything, uh, anything that we can do? Such a director here, Cindy Carter, just helped me through this. Awesome, so the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, morning, everyone. My name is Dave Kent. I'm a president of Peak First Nova Scotia. Our organi organization supports individuals who have been labeled with an intellectual disability to find their voice, speak for themselves, and promote quality for all people which have been labeled with an intellectual disability. We believe in the Canadian Charter of Rights, Human Rights, and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. We spoke out when Landon Webb challenged the old Nova Scotia Independence Act. We were encouraged when the courts found the act against people's rights and the Nova Scotia government agreed. People First Nova Scotia was pleased to be asked to be involved in talking on this new act. We were disappointed in the new bill act of the Adult Capacity and Decision Making Act. The main problem with the bill is that it puts its place a uh, place a sub substitute decision maker for a person instead of a supportable decision maker. Article 12 of the United Nations Convention, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities states that the proper measures should be taken to provide access by people with disabilities to make sure to, to support that many requirements is exercising their legal capacity. This bill does not put any measure in place to provide support to people to exercise their legal capacity. This bill does not protect the basic rights of Nova Scotians with intellectual disability. This, this is not what we were promised in the government document of the roadmap. I outlined this concern in my letter in early September to the Department of Justice in response to a brief challenge chance to review the draft law. People for Canada's paper 
Constitution paper of legal capacity was also sent. I have provided copies of these documents. Yeah. Excuse me for a sec. Not a problem. Another problem with the new law is that all current guardianship orders will stay in place. This means none of the individuals who were under guardianship will be reviewed. There could be another dozen Landon Webb out there who will still be having their basic rights violated. No one is protected their rights. Futuremore, there is no method to support adults who have had an application made or their families or professionals involved in the proceedings. There is no supervisation after a representative has been appointed. This means this is this means there is no way to ensure the rights of the individual are protected. We are concerned about the confusion confusing process of the capacity assessment. The tool, the tool to do and train for these completing the, the work is scary that in this act is presentable, can get permission from the courts to give consents for an adult to go through disturbing treatment that re, re, represents a bond of an adult human rights. There, th this, there is no reference of the United Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities in the Act. Canada was one of the first countries to ratify this international law, and this is something that could make every Canadian proud. This new law should directly reflect international law and it should be identified right in the act. This act means to mean this new act will mean to it was meant to provide people with intellectual abilities to protect with protection. We are very disappointed that it seems more like the old, outdated act that everything and anything else. Dave Kemp, President, Pete First of Nova Scotia. Thank you very much. David, thank you very much. Questions? Can we have your uh, copy of your notes also uh, for, for the record? Oh, I see you've brought copies. Thank you very much. Ms. Chandler. Dave, thank you for your presentation. Um, I think a lot of people have pointed out that it's important that we hear from people like you who will be implicated by the act, so I'm really glad that you came to speak to us today. Uh, my question um, is about uh, what kind of support would be helpful for you. So a number of people have shown, pointed out that there's no, there's, and you started by saying that it's, it's a substitute rather than supported decision making in this act. Uh, what support do you have and find helpful now or do you think that we might put in this act? How might that show up here? Well, I have a, I have a intellectual disability and it took me, I don't know if it relates to this or not, it took, it took me eight, eight years to get funding through the government to 
had my own apartment, and somebody helped me with my everyday needs, like groceries and stuff, and hygiene, and doctor appointments. I mean, I lived in a boarding house for 14 years, and I, I was ready to give up on life. And then this came in, in effect, and it really affected me. It just, I, uh, I think my support worker would be more helpful with something like this, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dave, very much. Again, it's always nice to have the human emotional part brought here, and, and you did uh, an extremely good job in, in representing that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That is the end of our presenters for uh, bill number 16. We'll just take a one, two minute recess, and then we'll be right back. Thank you.
order. I'd like to call the uh, Law Amendments Committee back to order. Ms. McFarlane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like at this time to put a motion on the floor that we take the opportunity to defer this bill back to the Department of Justice. I think it's clearly stated that there's a lot of amendments that need to be made, and I would hope that everyone here on the committee agree to that. Does that need to be seconded? No, you don't. Any other questions? Okay, there's a motion on the floor to defer the bill back to the department. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion's defeated. We will be referring uh, 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 Mr. McGuire. Mr. Chair, I move that the Adult Capacity and Decision Making Act be moved back to the House without amendments. There's a motion on the floor that the bill be moved back to the House without amendments. All those in favour? Aye. Contrary minded? Nay. Motion's carried. We have about uh, 20 minutes maybe before the next presenter. So I would like to take this opportunity to certainly thank the, uh, the folks at Ledge TV for live streaming, uh, our interpreter that we have, and uh, all the work that's been done to, um, to make this available and accessible. Thank you very much. We'll adjourn for about 10 minutes at the most.
order. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I know we're a little bit we're a little bit early here. It's 10:40, um, but any time you can take advantage of time, it's never a bad thing. Uh, just for those of you, I did mention that this is live streamed, uh, and it is going to continue to be live streamed uh, for the rest of the day, which is nice. Uh, Ledge TV informed us that the technical uh, issues with switching it back and forth, uh, it's always better to keep it going for the days once they have it set up. So I thank Ledge TV for that again. Our next bill is bill number 29, the Marine Renewable Energy Act, and we have uh, Mr. Jamie McNeil here, if he could come forward. Mr. McNeil, thank you very much. So the format is 10 minutes for presentation and five minutes for questions. The floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, to members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jamie McNeil. I'm the uh, country manager for uh, Big Moon Canada Corporation. We're very happy to be here in support of Bill Number 29, the Marine Renewable Energy Act. Nova Scotia took bold steps when it created force. The province made a commitment to early stage research and development of tidal technology. That commitment has paid off. We know more about tidal energy than any other jurisdiction in the world. We have pioneered innovation and research that will have benefits in multiple industries. We are on the leading edge of the tidal industry, de uh, tidal industry development right here in Nova Scotia. The steps the government has taken in Bill 29 is the next logical step in the evolution of our tidal energy industry. New entrants such as Big Moon Power have benefited from the work that has been done at Force by the original birth holders and by the other stakeholders. We have learned from their work, benefited from their experiences. Now is the time to build on what we have learned, what has been accomplished. I think it's important to keep things in perspective. Tidal energy is following a curve similar to the wind technology development. Denmark was a pioneer in the wind industry many years ago. They led not only by example, but also through investment of time and public resources. Wind was expensive and it was inefficient, but it evolved, it got better, it got cheaper. Wind is now an important part of every energy portfolio in every industrialized nation of the world, and the price continues to fall. We all have retirement and financial plans. The first thing we are told when we sit down with that financial advisor in the very first meeting is you need to, di to diversify your portfolio. Energy supply is now the same. A diversified portfolio of multiple sources of energy is essential. Wind and hydro have taken their place within that portfolio. Title is next. So when I look at Nova Scotia and what we are doing through Bill 29, we are taking the next logical step attracting the next generation of technology, driving developers to push the price lower and lower, setting standards that will build on what has been done in the Bay and push us to continuously improve. Through this job, we've, uh, we, we go to a lot of conferences, and I was at a conference uh, about a year ago in London, and one of the one of the presenters, in fact, the, the presenter who followed the, uh, the, the Parliamentary Secretary for Natural Resources in, uh, in the UK was uh, our own uh, Executive Director from the Nova Scotia Department of, Environ uh, of Energy, uh, Mr. Keith Collins, who's actually here. And his message was very straightforward. Um, if you look at the price curve of wind, it's following a very dramatic shift downward. If you look at the uh, price curve of solar, it is starting down that very same path. And as tidal developers, if we don't have our eye on that particular part of the equation, then we're missing the point. It's very important that we find a technology that works, but it's also as important that we find a technology that can compete in the market because taxpayers and the public are not going to support us forever. And I think this next generation of tidal providers need to keep that in mind as we come to Nova Scotia 
to test our technologies and to demonstrate the great and tremendous potential of tidal that we understand that we need to be competitive with wind, we need to be competitive with hydro, we need to be competitive with that entire portfolio of energy resources so that we can play our role. Nova Scotia had a choice, sit back and hope tidal technology evolves on its own somewhere else, or build on the first steps we took a few short years ago and like Denmark with wind, build a tidal industry here that can be exported around the world. As a Nova Scotian, as someone working to help build that industry, I am proud the government has introduced Bill 29, taking the next steps to build the industry right here in our province. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McNeil. Time, Mr. McGuire. Uh, you touched on the um, competitiveness of tidal versus solar versus wind. How do you actually, how do you plan on producing tidal energy uh, when the cost to produce solar and um, uh, uh, wind is significantly cheaper, especially when it comes to the infrastructure? Yeah, well, I think that's why what the, what the government has done here in Nova Scotia over, over a number of years is so in incredibly important. Yes, a structure has been put in place to attract research and development money, and that attraction has come. We have the leading uh, companies in tidal in the world working here in Nova Scotia, and now the next generation of those developers is coming behind and, and, and learning. But the message has been very clear. The support from the public is only there for so long, so we have a very finite time in which we can take this technology and make it competitive. And that's really what is, is important in, in R&D and in industry, is to put that competitive landscape in place that says you have a certain amount of time. This is, this is, this is how long you have to develop and to make yourself competitive. If we, you know, we can come up with the, the greatest ideas in the world, if they're not priced in a way in which consumers are going to buy it, then we've missed the mark. Mr. McGuire. Thank you. The second question that I had was sitting on a, I think it was a resource committee uh, last year, and we had a presenter come forward um, who said that um, tidal energy is destroying the local marine life. And they presented some pretty graphic pictures. Um, how do you counter that? Well, I mean, I, I think Tidal, tidal energy is, an, is a new development. It is, it is something like anything else that's new. I think if you, you know, and I'll, I'll stick with my example of wind. When, when new wind farms were being put up in, you know, all over Nova Scotia and all around the world, people were concerned about the effects of, of light flicker. Uh, people were concerned about, you know, bird migration patterns and deaths. And, and, and it's important that people challenge and push back and pr make folks like ourselves and regulatory bodies like the government ensure that everything is done appropriately. And I think the experience that we went through with wind is that wind is safe, wind is reliable, and it's, a, it's an important part of the portfolio. I expect, would expect nothing less that that conversation would take place uh, around tidal, that people who are using the Bay of Fundy for livelihood, for recreation or just for the fact that they're in Nova Scotia and it's part of our natural environment that they want to protect it. And I think that's an incredibly important discussion to have. And I think that it's, it's incumbent upon us to work with the users of the Bay, to work with the regulators and the government to ensure that our industry follows once again what happened with wind, which is the safe and um, uh, normalized development of this technology in conjunction with other stakeholders and the users of the Bay. Thank you. Oh. Oh, Mr. McGuire. Sorry. So well, it's, it, it's safe to say that your uh, industry is uh, invested in making sure that the local environment and the local marine environment in particular is not being negatively impacted and you want to build relationships with the community. Um, what are, where are some good examples, and this will be my last question, but where are some good examples of uh, the positive impact that uh, tidal energy has had on local communities, be it in Canada or globally? 
Well, I, you know, at, at its at its infancy, I think right now I, I will just I will look at I will look at our own company uh, specifically. Uh, we have we have taken a lot of time uh, to work very closely with the people uh, that have been using the bay, uh, whether it's whether it's the fishing community, whether it's First Nations. Um, we find that it's you know. We're the new kids on the block. They have been using this this resource for generations, and it's incumbent upon us to be able to show up and work in a collaborative and cooperative fashion with those folks who have been using this resource for generations. Therefore, we have been listening, taking in their their advice, and to the second half of your question about benefits, you know, the the the. the, the the fishermen in particular understand these waterways. I mean, it's it, navigating in the Bay of Fundy is not an easy thing to do. The water moves at an incredible rate. If you don't know what you're doing, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble very quickly. Um, utilizing the expertise, uh, employing uh, f uh, fishing boats and their and their crews to be able to access areas, uh, leaning on local contractors and engineering groups. Uh, the, what we're doing here is developing an industry in the marine environment, and there are very few areas in the world that understands the uh, operating in the marine environment better than Nova Scotia, and we've we've tapped into that resource quite heavily. Thank you, Mr. McNeil. If we could have a copy of your notes, that would be appreciated. Absolutely. So that concludes our presenters for Bill Number Twenty Nine, the Marine Renewable Energy Act. Mr. Irvin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I move that Bill Number 29, an act to amend Chapter 32 of the Acts of 2015, the Marine Renewables Energy Act, be referred back to the House without amendment. There's a motion on the floor to move Bill 29, the Marine Renewable Energy Act, forward without amendments. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Contrary minded. Motion's carried. So we have a couple of minutes here. Again, I'd uh, suggest maybe we just take a five minute recess and then we'll begin with the uh, workman's compensation bill. Uh, first speaker up, Janet Hazelton, I believe she's here. So take a five minute recess. Thank you.
we could uh, call the Law Amendments Committee meeting to order, please. Where am I? Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think for the benefit of uh, of the presenters, uh, we have Bill Seven, the Workers' Compensation Act. Um, for the benefit of uh, presenters and those attending, it's probably appropriate that we go through uh, committee introductions. So if I could ask Ms. Chender, please. Uh, I'm Claudia Chender, the MLA for Dartmouth South. Tammy Martin, I'm the, the uh, MLA for Cape Breton Centre. I forgot where I was. <laughs> Brad Johns, MLA for Sackville and Beaver Bank. Eddie Orl, MLA Northside Westmount. Uh, Mark Fury, I'm the chair and MLA for Lunenburg West. Rafa de Costanzo, MLA Clayton Park West. Kelly Regan, MLA for Bedford. Keith Irving, MLA Kings South. Good morning, Brendan McGuire, MLA Halifax Atlantic. I would also uh, indicate that a change sheet has been uh, distributed um, for the committee members' attention. Bill 7, Workers' Compensation Act. And with that, I would call our first presenter, uh, Janet Hazelton. <coughs> Good morning. So my name is Janet Hazelton, and I'm the current president of the Nova Scotia Nurses Union. We represent 7,000 nurses, uh, licensed practical nurses, nurse practitioners, and of course registered nurses. And our nurses work in all areas of health care. Uh, we work in long-term care facilities. Uh, we represent all the licensed practical nurses and registered nurses with VON, and of course in acute care, out, mostly outside of Central, and the nurses at the IWK. So this uh, legislation is very important uh, for NSNU. We have been lobbying for uh, PTSD coverage for nurses for a long time, uh, probably as long as I've been president, and that's 14 years. Um, nursing is a great profession, and the nurses I represent love what they do, but unfortunately sometimes it involves some very traumatic experiences. Nurses see patients experiencing extreme pain and suffering. They care for children who are abused, both physically and sexually. Like other first responders, they see humanity at its worst, worst and patients there when they're most vulnerable. Unfortunately, the thoughts and experience at work are not easily compartmentalized. They stay with nurses and affect every aspect of their life. In some Canadian jurisdictions, presumptive PTSD legislation is reserved for traditionally male-dominated professions. Nurses unions across this country have been lobbying governments and compensation boards to recognize the reality of PTSD in nursing and the obligation to provide appropriate care and compensation for those affected. The NSNU is happy to see that in Nova Scotia, this legislation specifically names nurses and continuing care assistants, and we're grateful for that, which are typically female dominated. We encourage both legislators here and the governor and council to seriously consider other professions that regularly deal with trauma, including social workers. The list of prescribed diagnosticians is not listed in the act, but is rather left to the governor and council to determine via regulation. We would like to emphasize that the legislation will be limited, will be of limited help if PTSD sufferers are unable to obtain a diagnosis due, a, due to lack of access to psychiatrists or other specialists. Diagnosing PTSD is within the scope of both family physicians and nurse practitioners. And so both should be included in this legislation or regulations so to, so to increase the access and allow this legislation to improve many lives as possible. My last comments concerns when the presumptive will be deemed to be in force. The Nurses Union urges that in, in the legislation or in regulation, the date be set in the past such that there, those who are unjustly denied coverage are able to receive it. Rectifying potential past injustice could involve a review of rejected claims related to PTSD. 
a grace period to allow for new claims based on past events, and an ability for workers who were previously denied coverage to easily instigate a claims appeal. I thank, thank you again for the opportunity to comment on this important piece of legislation. We encourage its passing and hope you will heed the recommendations we have made here today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hazelton. Uh, any questions of Mr. Oral? Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Hazelton, for your presentation. So, you would like to see more people included in the bill or included in the regulations? Either um, the, the bill or the regulations, but it's, it's very difficult um, in the health field to designate, like uh, almost every healthcare worker, regardless of where they work, um, can have PTSD. It's not just nurses and it's not just, it could be people working in the kitchen, it could be, who knows. But healthcare is a very, very stressful um, occupation anywhere in the healthcare system, especially when we're under financial crunches. Mrs. Mm -hmm. Martin? for your uh, comments, Janet. So I'm curious now how many people, or do you have an idea of the amount of people that are currently off suffering from this that are unable to obtain any sort of benefit? I, I wouldn't know the answer. But, but, but are there? Oh, there are, there are some. And there's some that are suffering with PTSD that might be still working. And when this legislation gets passed, they'd be able to access through the workers' comp. They don't, they, they could still work, but then they would have benefits. The option. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Ms. Shender. So, thank you, Janet, for your presentation. And along similar lines, you mentioned the diagnosticians. Do you have, like, at least even anecdotal evidence that folks are having a hard time oh, accessing well, people? To we diagnose? all know how difficult it is to access mental health in this province. Yeah. And very few of our smaller communities, Canso, <clears throat> Guysboro, um, the, they don't have psychiatrists or psychologists in the community. But we do have nurse practitioners, and nurse practitioners are able to diagnose um, PTSD. It's within their scope, and I would like to see it in the legislation, not, not leave it up to regulations if I could, because we need to be serious about this. And nurse practitioners are in a lot of our smaller communities. That is their health care. Um, that is their family physician, is, is often a nurse practitioner, and they must be allowed to diagnose and treat PTSD. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hazelton. Any other questions? Thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you. Our next presenter is Mr. Jason McLean. I have copies for everybody as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson, members of the committee, for this opportunity to speak about Bill 7, an act to amend Workers' Compensation Act. I'm Jason McLean, president of NSGEU. The Nova Scotia Government General Employees Union, NSGEU, is the largest union in the province representing about 31,000 workers across the public sector in the provincial government, corrections, health care, public schools, community colleges, universities, municipalities, and community organizations. The NSGU represents a range of workers who are in emergency responders, police, peace officers, social workers, correctional workers, paramedics, sheriffs, probation officers, firefighters, licensed practical nurses and registered nurses, home support, continuing care workers, and more. These are the people you need by your side at a time of crisis, and all of them can be confronted with unthinkable and unfortunate unforgettable situations. The very nature of their work makes mistakes. The very nature of their work makes these workers vulnerable to post-traumatic stress disorder. Unfortunately, these emergency responders aren't receiving the, the supports they need uh, when they develop PTSD because of their working environment and the variety of calls they respond to. So first off, thank you. Thanks to Dave Wilson 
and the NDP caucus for their numerous attempts at bringing this issue forward and keeping it on the front burner. Thanks to the PC caucus for their support on this issue, and thanks to Minister Regan, who brought this bill forward last spring, and Minister Kasoulis and members of the Liberal government introducing the bill, or sorry, Bill 7 in this session. You're all going to be surprised at my next comments, but I want to thank the Premier for this bill. <laughs> It is on record. I know this is something that has struck a chord with him. It was last year on November 10, 2016, just outside on the corner of Granville Street and George Street, the NSGU joined the Union of Canadian Correctional Officers, UCO, to raise awareness for the need for amendment to the WCB Act nationally and provincially to include automatic coverage for PTSD for first responders. UCO was doing a nationwide campaign to give public lawmakers like yourself a sense of what work life is like in a correctional facility. They designed the inside of a truck or inside of a tractor trailer as a jail and had people playing the role of inmates. It just so happened when I toured the vehicle, the Premier was right behind me. When we finished, the Premier and I chatted and he said something along the lines that we, we have to do something about this. I said any time, and we met a few times last year or sorry, last winter and last spring to discuss the bill, and he even gave me a preview before it was introduced. So even though that he and I, so even though that he and I may disagree on some issues, it is important that we always can uh, set those issues aside and work together on common interests uh, for the betterment of Nova Scotia. As it stands, the legislation intends to cover continuing care assistance, correctional officers, emergency responders, dispatchers, firefighters, nurses, paramedics, police officers, and it gives Cabinet the ability to cover other persons in occupations prescribed by the legislation. I would like to see the initial list broaden to include sheriffs, social workers, and probation officers, all of whom have to deal with horrific situations. For instance, when Bill 7 was introduced, I received an email from a sheriff asking it why wouldn't they be covered? When, uh, when I said, or sorry, would they be covered? When I said no, they were miffed and asked, or sorry, I, when I said no, they were missed, I asked him to send, me, send some issues so I could use it in my presentation. Here's what he said. Jason, a few incidents spring to mind just in our geographical area. One officer has witnessed three hangings. In cells, we have, we've had had urine and feces thrown our way, as well as intimidation and threats, threats to family, our person, and property. Dealing with people in the common areas of the courthouse. Uh, during trials, during trial hearings, testimony regarding sexual, sexual misconduct against children, violent murders, and yes, at times, pictures of autopsies are viewed in court as well. On transport, we have witnessed violent accidents resulting in death, had prisoners breach the cages and try to get at us. All this and not even mentioning that we have been physically assaulted, spit upon, uh, verbal, obscenity, uh, verbal obscenities all day long directed our way by persons in custody. Jason, although these things come with the territory, as it were, it does affect some officers to their detriment. Anyways, thanks for your time. These are the thoughts contributed by a number in our office, and we appreciate your word to respect our anonymity. So stop and think, stop and think what this will do to each of you, and remember that as social workers, we send into broken homes, probation officers, who deal with troubled youth face the same type of problems. And they all have to do their jobs shorthanded and with lack of additional resources like mental health supports to help their clients. Therefore, I strongly urge you to amend the initial list to include the, mention, the above mentioned occup occupations. In conclusion, thanks again for finally recognizing this issue. Thanks again for reintroducing this bill, and thanks in advance for passing this am amended bill and getting these Nova Scotians the help that, and support that they need. We appreciate this opportunity to speak with you and welcome any questions or comments. Thank you, Mr. McLean. Uh, questions to our presenter? 
Ms. Martin. Thank you. Thanks, Jason, for that. Um, again, I'll ask you the same thing I asked Janet. Do you know of, uh, do you have any idea if people are actually coming to work because with PTSD because they don't have an option to stay at home and deal with their, with their situation? Or do you have a lot of people that are home without benefit because of, because of the situation that they find themselves in? Well, it, that's, that's not a simple no. uh, question to answer. So the way, the way I look at it, and I come from corrections. I worked 22 years in a correctional facility. So I know a lot of people that are suffering from PTSD, although they're off on other, <coughs> other ailments, right? And uh, I, I, I know the statistics are, uh, or sorry, I don't know the statistics, but I do know that the, the proper help needs to be given to the mm -hmm. people that are, that are suffering from PTSD to actually even know that they have PTSD. Mm -hmm. Right? So there are issues, there's triggers for people and whatnot, but uh, I believe this is something because it already, and I think this opens the door, and that's why like, I sit here today to talk to everybody. Uh, there, there's also, in, in all of those occupations that I mentioned, you need to be strong to do your job. That is the feeling. And if somebody suffers from post-traumatic stress, uh, they may view themselves as not being strong, therefore not really disclosing that mm -hmm. they have PTSD or whatever. Uh, and I find a lot of people hide behind other ailments mm -hmm. because there's a stigma attached exactly. to having post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Oral. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation, Jason. So you said you'd like to see this bill passed as amended? As amended, with, with the amendments, with the amendments that, that we're suggesting there. go in there. If that doesn't happen and it's going to be done in the regulations, would you still be supportive of this bill without that added to the bill and, and wait for the regulations, or would you prefer to see that the amendment be passed instead? I, I, I absolutely couldn't continue on in life not supporting this bill. Right, uh, you know, and forgive me, Mr. Chairperson, uh, the the governing party isn't my party of choice at the moment. Uh, although I thank you very much for bringing this bill forward. Um, these here are no-brainers, I believe. I, you guys have my my document that I just read to you. Uh, you can look into it further. These are positions that I believe are at risk and should be added in there. If they weren't added in there, NSGEU is still going to, to support this bill, but we're not going to stop the lobby to have these positions added in there. So I just believe uh, you, you can actually stop the inevitable by doing it today as opposed to uh, doing it later. I had, I just see occupations that are put in there that actually you can protect people and put it forward. I mean, it wasn't long ago I sent a message to uh, the chairperson, and uh, and actually the the what I just read to you I sent to him, so he's well aware of it, and I and I do appreciate that he has many years of policing as well, so he would know who you're dealing with. Uh, and I'll use the example of the sheriffs. Myself, I work with a certain clientele. Well, guess who the sheriffs work with? the same clientele. So yes, I'm appreciative that correctional officers are going to be added to this, but the people that are direct links to the correctional officers are those that I mentioned in, in this here document. So I would uh, strongly suggest and ask that you put that in there. Thank you, Mr. Orlan, Mr. McLean. Uh, Mr. McGuire. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so, thank you for your presentation today. Um, could you just take me through uh, a 911 call comes in, um, somebody's assaulted, uh, let's say uh, a family member, uh, spouse, uh, assaults, they assault each other. Um, how many hands does that pass through? What occupations does that pass through? Let's just say, I mean, I know it's, we could go for years, but within the first 24 to 48 hours, so a husband, a father uh, assaults a wife, a mother. Well, I didn't know there'd be quests. There's quizzes. <laughs> Um, so, just say an assault happens, uh, the police show up, the police deal with the situation. Also what ends up happening is uh, that family's in crisis. So that's where you could see uh, 
child welfare getting involved and whatnot. Uh, the family court obviously could get involved. Then you're looking at corrections when somebody gets remanded because apparently uh, there is supposed to be, and you don't always see it, but zero tolerance mm -hmm. on uh, domestic violence. Um, then when the, when the correctional officers are dealing with them, when the social workers in the correction setting, uh, they're passed on to the sheriffs to go to court, and so you have everybody in the courtroom, which would be the court reporters as well as uh, the, uh, the lawyers that are there, the, um, the sheriffs that are there as well. And, um, and then it's just, uh, it's just a vicious circle so a from there. So a lot of people end up getting affected by one incident, right? But there's always incidents. They continue on and they don't stop. Uh, people are supposed to just move on to the next case, move on to the next case. That's something that's very difficult for most people anyway. So as a correction officer for 22 years, um, how did you deal with it? Well, it's interesting. I, uh, one part that sticks out for me uh, through my career is uh, we had a riot which we've had many of, mm -hmm. right? So I've been punched in the face, I've been spit on, I've had feces thrown at me, urine thrown at me. Um, but this one was a bunch of offenders, they were, they were high, they were on, on something. And we came in and we ended up getting everybody locked up and, and dealt with the situation, so we thought. Uh, just a little while later, we had to go back down to the area because one of the offenders who was on a, a waiting trial for murder uh, hung himself. So uh, we had to call for backup for the rest of our shift. Um, we came down, uh, two, of my, two of my coworkers picked him up. I ran back to the, to the box, grabbed a JP knife is what we called it at the time, and I came and I cut him down just below the ligature on the... On the uh, on the noose that he had, that he was hanging from. And uh, he was blue and he, he urinated on himself and we lowered him down, put him down and it felt like an eternity because we were trying to figure out who's gonna do mouth to mouth on this person, right? Who's gonna do CPR? And, but it was only a couple of seconds and uh, one of my coworkers knelt down, he was gonna give uh, CPR and he, he started to, choke a little bit, cough a little bit, so he was regaining his breathing, which was uh, a relief to us, and we put him over in a prone position, and, uh, you know, we already had the police called, the ambulance called, and everything else. So, but what happened was uh, our supervisor at the time uh, got us to all go to our posts. So we all went to our posts, uh, and we carried on and did work that night, which we shouldn't have. We should have had relief called out, we, we'd be sent home, and a critical, critical incident stress debrief be set up for us. That didn't happen. Um, not only that, it was only after weeks of my shift advocating for a SISM debrief that it ended up happening. So, um, but I will tell you, we did the SISM debrief. Uh, two of those co-workers ended up stopping work shortly after because of post-traumatic stress. Uh, not just that one incident, but a cumulation uh, effect. Um, but that was, I think, the straw that broke the camel's back for them. And uh, not only that, uh, from time to time, me and some coworkers will talk about that incident. It took me over a year when I was doing rounds in that area of the correctional facility. I would do rounds and I would stop and I would stare at that cell. And I would just stare at it and then continue on and do my rounds. So it's just something that stuck with me. It, it will never leave me, that situation. But what it did was teach me that, you know what, people are doing work and their lives are at risk and what they see can affect them. And I've seen it firsthand with my coworkers and I've seen it with myself. Thank you. Mr. Irving. Waiting for a microphone. There we go. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Clark, for your presentation. Um, clearly, uh, I, I don't know how this list was built, but clearly there must be some uh, statistics or, or uh, sort of common knowledge of these professions as being the area that we need to address first. Um, 
And I guess my, my, my comment would be for those that feel that there should be other professions at it, and, and we do have that ability in, the, in, the, in this bill in terms of uh, governor, governor and council making regulations to add to this list. I, I think it's incumbent on perhaps all of us to be, begin to build the case for other, uh, others to be added. Uh, I, I, I think um, uh, the, you know, it's, it's important, you know, I can think of other, others that haven't been mentioned here, you know, when you talk about the impacts of, of uh, what goes on in a courtroom. And I knew a judge that listened to horrific stories for her whole career. Um, so I think that's where that flexibility is in, in this legislation. And I think uh, whether it's unions or government or various professions that uh, uh, do you know, are in areas that have a certain amount of risk, um, that we build those statistics so that then the order and council, uh, you know, can can be putting those resources where they're most effectively uh, uh, supported in terms of the, the most people. So that would be my sort of comment to, to your request here, uh, is that we we build evidence in which to base our, right. uh, our legislation. We so if, if I could respond to your Please. statement. Um, I don't think, you, I guess anecdotally, you don't have to look any further than the reports that have been in a newspaper recently about burnout with, uh, with social workers, case aides, and whatnot. Uh, but being government, you do have access to the statistics for sick leave uh, and people being burnt out and the issues that you're dealing with in these occupations that I mentioned. You have it all, you could look at it and, and decide from there, right? But, uh, and again, this is no criticism, truly no criticism to the bill. I just believe it needs to go further. And uh, I come up, w I come up with, with some occupations and I agree with you, there's more occupations that most likely should be covered there, right? But I'm talking on the accumulative, accu I have a hard time with that word. Cumulative. It's the hardest word for me ever. Uh, <laughs> the accumulative effect, right? So it, it's, and I do believe that these occupations that I mentioned need to be recognized there because they're constantly dealing with people who are in crisis. I mean, people that are going to see social workers aren't going to see social workers because they just won the lottery and they really need to, uh, learn how to handle themselves with that situation, they're actually in crisis, right? So uh, when you have inherently negative and in, in, uh, perpetually uh, in crisis uh, clients that you're dealing with, then I believe those occupations need a little bit more attention paid to them uh, than actually what you are thinking today. So I, I really encourage you to access that data because I believe it will help you make a conscious decision moving forward. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Irvin, for the question and Mr. McLean for the response. Uh, appreciate your candid comments um, and uh, the time that you've extended to us today. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mary Lloyd. I'm sorry, Larry Maloney as well. Yes, please come to the table and join your colleague. We'll uh, always conscious of time, and I neglected to speak to it at the opening of, um, of our committee meeting. Uh, 10 minutes for presentations and five minutes for response, and certainly some flexibility given the context of the discussion. Thank you. Good morning. Um, we're, uh, my name is Mary Lloyd, I'm the president and, and founder of Pictou County Injured Workers Association and our role is to advocate and trying to keep the system in check with what its founding principles are. We are grateful that the government has introduced this bill and the intent to provide presumptive benefits to first responders and others dealing with emergency related conditions. But this proposed legislation does not go far enough. Automatic assumption versus presumption. The consultation materials identify the purpose of, and the, of the amendment is to ensure post-traumatic stress experienced by emergency first responders will be presumed to be as a result of their work and they will not be, not be required to prove the work-relatedness of the condition. The proposed amendment does not provide any greater 
presumption of work relatedness than what's already existent in the current act. All workers under the current legislation are entitled to the presumption. 10.4 of the act provides that it is to be presumed that the condition arose out of and in the course of the workplace unless the contrary is shown. This doesn't change that. So all workers are entitled to that under the legislation. A worker needs only show a causal connection between the injury condition and the workplace activity. The proposed amendment contains essentially the same language as Section 10.4. It is not the legislation that results in workers having to prove the work relatedness of post-traumatic stress. It is WCB policy and their adjudicative processes. And what this bill will do is codify WCB practices and policies, which is scary. The problem with the, is not with legislation as we sit here today. The problem is with workers' compensation system and how they adjudicate claims. The current requirement for establishing a claim for psychological injury pursuant to Section 2 definition of accident is a worker must link the psychological condition to a traumatic event at the workplace, and that is make a causal connection. This can be accomplished usually during the uh, accident report, but WCB policy 1.3.9 requires the worker to provide a diagnosis in accordance with the DSM, Diagnostic uh, Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, by a registered psychologist or psychiatrist. The proposed amendment does not change this criteria. It simply codifies in legislation the WCB policy process. The current bill does not provide faster adjudication of post-traumatic claim, nor does it uh, alleviate the burden upon the worker to relive the, these experiences. Pictou County injured workers suggest Bill 7 be amended to establish an automatic assumption for post-traumatic stress claims for all workers. The language should be clear and unambiguous. Any worker, we propose this wording, any worker diagnosed by a treating medical practitioner as displaying characteristics of post-traumatic stress shall have their claim accepted. The WCB then would be able to accept the claim promptly in order to provide any wage replacement benefits and expedite treatment to a psychiatrist or a psychologist. The formal diagnosis of post-traumatic stress pursuant to the DSM could be done in due course. It is vital to note the definition of accident in Section 2 of the legislation does not require a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress. A psychological condition arising out of and in the course of the workplace require ongoing medical treatment and lead to a permanent impairment. The codification, of w the codification of WCB policy requirements into legislation would be inconsistent with Section 2 of the Act. Workers eligible for coverage, all workers experiencing traumatic workplace event and who develop post-traumatic symptoms should be included in this legislation. Assumption presumption. For example, a pedestrian is struck and killed by a bus driver, say a metro bus driver. What you're proposing here is that all the first responders, the police officers, the paramedics, the uh, firefighters would all be treated one way and the person who was driving the bus and killed the pedestrian is now having to jump through different hurdles. I don't think this will ta pass any test. I think it would be challenged too. And why should anyone have to be treated differently? The legislation should be all encompassing. Prescribed diagnostician. I have problems with this because we are very leery of WCB having any, any play in the diagnosing of conditions. Uh, it should be by treating physicians, treating nurse practitioners, treating psychologists, treating psychiatrists. Persons who may diagnose a worker with post-traumatic stress should be defined in the act, not regulations. Post-traumatic stress is a serious disorder which significantly affects a worker's a worker's ability to work, to interact with other people and function in all aspects of their life. The treatment of this condition requires specialized skills and training. Such treatment should only be provided by psychiatrists and psychologists. And 
Recently, a Pictou County injured worker client diagnosed with severe post-traumatic stress was informed by the WCV Tier 3 clinic that she didn't have any qualifications for post-traumatic stress, but WCB has given her a book and now he's going to be her guinea pig. Now that's not too reassuring or comforting to someone suffering from post-traumatic stress. As well, many of our workers who are suffering from post-traumatic stress, they have the diagnosis which, because of our health care, requires eight months, two years, we've seen to get into the, for that diagnosis. And then WCB overrules it by a WCB board medical doctor and they want a second opinion or they want one of their doctors. So it's not going to expedite people receiving treatment in any way, shape or form. Time limitation for claim risk recognition is not currently in this legislation except under occupational disease and it's five years then from the time the person is first made aware they have a work-related condition. You're putting restrictions and time in and, and that doesn't ex exist today. Section 8 authorizes the government to prescribe by regulation uh, the time period following the worker ceasing employment, which with a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress must be in order for the presumption to apply. The inclusion of any time frame for this purpose is inconsistent with the government's background and stakeholder consultation document. On page one under the heading, what is post-traumatic stress disorder? The Department of Labor and Advanced Education writes, a person can develop PTSD soon after the triggering event or days, months, or even years. But now you have time frames and restrictions in that. The imposition of the legislation limitation within which to be diagnosed is inappropriate considering how post-traumatic stress may be developed or diagnosed. Uh, the current legal test utilized in adjudication is the section 83 time limits of filing a claim commence when a person reasonably becomes aware that condition or symptoms are related to a traumatic work event. Imposing time risk limits is inconsistent with the intent of the legislation. No time limit should be identified in the act in, or in the regulations. System, systemic change is required. Major changes to the legislation, WCB policies and WCB's adjudication practices are required in addition to the assumption presumption amendment. First, the current mindset of WCB adjudication is that all claims fit into one box. The injury occurs, the worker sent to physio for an assessment to determine what weight they can lift and pull and push. Doesn't matter what they've been diagnosed with. Unfortunately, WCB adjudicators and case managers appear to have no sensitivity or awareness of the issues relating to psychological and mental health related injuries. For example, WCB case managers will interpret an injured worker's unwillingness or inability to return to work or undergo certain medical treatment as non-cooperative. And, and threaten them with Section 84 of losing their benefits for non-compliance. In fact, it is the psychological condition that's inhibiting the worker from participation. WCB staff persons require significant sensitivity and diversity training in order to effectively adjudicate psychological injuries. Second, the impact of the legislation on the financial abilities of these workers. Every one of the workers you're identifying as first responders are well over the, the cap of the workers' compensation, which is uh, 59.3. When you look at the benefits for these people who are coming from maybe 80 or 90,000 or 70,000 dollars a year, and the max they would receive on WCB might be 34 to 36,000 dollars. That financial impact comp compacted on the psychological injury and some of these workers having a physical injury. If I, if I, may, as well. uh, I just I wanted to let you know you're, you have yep. reached your 10 minutes, but if, if you could bring your comments okay. to conclusion, I would certainly extend you that additional. Our association has grave concerns that the current bill, if passed, will not provide the prompt adjudication and treatment necessary for workers suffering psychological injury as a result of a traumatic workplace injury. Our association strongly encourages the government to ensure such serious issues as time limits for claim recognition, prescribed diagnosticians, and workers covered by the bill are defined in legislation, not regulations. The minister has already indicated the creation of regulations would be strongly influenced by WCB, and we have grave concerns with that. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you again for your comments. The next speaker, um, Mika McIsaac. Did I get that right? Is it Mika or Micah? It's Micah. Welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, again, my name is Micah McIsaac. I'm a social worker with Child Protection with the Department of Community Services. And I would just like to share a little perspective on that role. Thank you to the committee and this government for allowing me the opportunity to share my perspective for the possible amendments being considered and how it would relate to the field of social work within child protection. I don't want to invoke pity from this committee for members that choose to practice social work in this field. It is and will continue to be very challenging work. And through the numerous years of university, multiple degrees and placement hours, workers have an informed opinion of what they are stepping into. However, there is nothing that can truly prepare you for the first time you are physically separating a mother from a child, a child from their siblings, hearing a six-year-old child disclose physical and sexual abuse to you in an interview statement, or being called out in the night to identify the body of a murdered youth or a youth who has died from suicide. I personally, but sadly not exclusively, have had to investigate files that require me to view the remains of a dead infant, attend and process the autopsy, and then explain to the parents that I understand their grief and loss over the infant, but I now need to remove their other children from their care because of concerns of the safety of those children. It is not the threats or swearing you remember in most of these interactions. It is the sobbing that haunts you. I would be the first to tell you there are parents who cannot parent. But even flawed parents can still love their children, and their abused or neglected children can still love them back. And out of that confused state of love, you are left consoling and hearing the cries of parents and children on almost a daily basis. I recall a time I had been in a home and things had become so escalated that even the family dog, who was picking up on the emotional response of their owner, attempted to attack and was shot dead by police as you are forced to keep going along, doing your best interest to protect the child. On another occasion, two colleagues and I were removing a newborn baby from a home and quickly it turned into a standoff situation with us locked in the kitchen area along with police as the birth father was armed with a knife and the mother was running through the home with a newborn. In fact, one of, if not the longest recorded standoff in Halifax's history was when two child protection social workers attended a home to protect a child and were met with the blast of a shotgun through the door. If I had been bit by the dog or stabbed by the angered father, or if those workers had been shot by the shotgun. Without question, those situations would be fully recognized by workers' compensation as injuries related to the line of work. But just because you aren't physically injured in those situations doesn't mean you walk away unwounded. I am pleased that this government has made great effort to fund the mental health system in Nova Scotia in its latest budget and has recognized the benefit that having greater access to mental health service for the residents of Nova Scotia is a step towards building a healthy, vibrant province, stronger families, stronger schools, and with this amendment, a stronger first responder workforce. There once was a time that you could have become seriously injured in the workforce, but the threat of financial hardship if you were to adequately take the time away from work to address the stages of healing forced you to have no other option but to work injured and possibly make matters worse. Thankfully, workers' compensation was established and the worker now has certain protections from financial and ongoing risk of physical harm in the workplace. 
currently, as it was stated, it is, a, it is in the news that child protection social workers are experiencing high rates of burnout, stress, taking leaves from work due to mental health illness. It may be a misconception in the general population that these workers are off on a mini vacation with full pay using some loophole to get a break. Many of these workers whom I know have been on the job for 10 to 20 years without issue in the past. Many of these workers are off receiving a fraction of their pay and struggling to provide for themselves and their families. The idea of just going back to work to return to full pay is not worth continuing down a path that has led to depression, addiction, health issues, broken homes, etc. Often people who deal with mental health issues of others for a living don't properly address their own. This amendment per would provide an opportunity for first responders such as social workers to take time to properly heal and to return to the workplace with the ability to provide another 10 to 20 years of high level professional service to the public instead of rushing back, becoming re-injured and going off on a series of absences that are often short term which means their positions cannot be backfilled. This causes workforce staffing issues and workload crisis. This directly affects client service delivery for Nova Scotians who require these services. The taxpayers of Nova Scotia deserve to have a healthy workforce of first responders whom they can count on to provide care and protection to everyone, including the most vulnerable members of our communities. The first responders who provide this service and willingly put themselves in difficult or dangerous situations deserve to count on our employers and government to be there for us when we need them, when we need to be protected and taken care of. Again, I thank this committee and the setting government for taking the time to consider these amendments and their beneficial impact on the health of first responders in Nova Scotia. Please list the profession of social workers as well in the act alongside those others you've named, because in Nova Scotia, we are providing protection to children, the elderly, we are working within public schools, private practice, hospitals, prisons, and many other fields that all share the same common goal, to intervene for those in crisis and advocate for those in need. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, significant insight from your employee capacity, so thank you for that. Questions? Mr. McGuire. Good to see you again. You. <clears throat> What's the average career of a front... I'm just going to throw some questions at you. What's the average career of a frontline social worker now? Time frame? Yeah. Um, sadly, uh, you still might have a social worker stay within the department, but transfer rates to move out of a frontline role or going off on leaves uh, is very high at this present time. Um, Why? Well, I think when you are, in my own personal experience, uh, when you're faced with the daily contact with the public, um, the public that is in crisis, and you are doing your best, but still, there's unavoidable things that happen, and without that proper support, without seeing success, which most people thrive off in an occupation, uh, and also success is not guaranteed in this line of work, it just beats you down. Um, you question if you are doing a good service. Um, and that, so, so on many occasions, it just gets the best of you. So your job was to walk into a home in crisis and physically remove a child from its, their parents. How long did you do that for? Uh, for about four years in this province. Why did you and transfer out? I'm now in a role of adoption because I just uh, felt that you are removing children. You're placing them into a system that, again, you hope is providing the best level of care, and many times 
it's a repetition. Most times you are not looking to ever remove a child. That's the last Resort. option. Uh, so you might have reoccurring contact with the same family over and over again. Um, and I would say it's almost more troubling when you don't remove, but you leave a child in a home that you know there's not enough to legally apprehend, but you worry about that child. You walk away from the home hoping that things will turn around. And that level of pressure just gets the best of you after a while. Have you ever walked into a home in crisis and not experienced trauma? Never. And I would just say to add to that turnover rate, it's a real disadvantage to the children that we serve to constantly have a new social worker in their life to break down the level of attachment that that child is trying to maintain with anybody that they see as a healthy relationship when due to burnout you have another worker and then another worker and there's just not consistency for long-term planning for that child. So with my own personal experience, I had one of my social workers for 10 years. Does that happen anymore? That would be very rare. So do you consider all social workers frontline worker, uh, first responders or do you? I would. Even, even in the role of adoption, uh, you are routinely interacting with children that are very hopeful to be adopted. And you constantly have to field their questions of asking, is there a home for me? Have you found anyone? Uh, sometimes you do find a home and then through that disruption, you have to remove the child from that home again and place them back into the system. And um, I would be very surprised if anybody that's connected to that community service world doesn't experience a level of PTSD. Are you going to spend 30 years in community services? I hope so. I hope this act would uh, provide the support for me to do so, because I do enjoy the work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for your insight. Thank you. The next presenter is Judy Lewis. Judy Lewis. Yeah, not. Um, let's uh, Jim Cormier. And if Jim could come forward, uh, Miss Lewis is not scheduled until twelve, so we would revert in the agenda to uh, to allow Miss Lewis that opportunity. So please uh, come forward, Mr. Cormier. Yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm uh, Jim Cormier. I am the Atlantic Director for the Retail Council of Canada. Uh, we're one of the largest industry associations in the country because we represent the largest private sector employer in the country. We represent everyone from your small Main Street retailers uh, that are in all of your constituencies right up through to the large national and international retail chains that many of which are also in most of your communities. We're the largest private sector employer, as I mentioned, in this province and every other province. Uh, retail trade accounts for almost $14 billion annually uh, in sales uh, across Nova Scotia. And we're here today to uh, express some concern with, uh, with Bill 7. First off, uh, we'd like to mention that it was a bit of a shame that uh, the consultation for this legislation did occur over a short time period during the summer months when many were on vacations. Uh, it was difficult to get folks out to the consultations. That said, further troubling was the fact that uh, we as Retail Council of Canada, we, we were not invited um, to participate. And again, as the largest private sector employer, we felt that we should uh, be receiving an invitation for such a consultation. That said, uh, with regards to Bill 7, um, it must be noted that our members, they do value the work undertaken regularly by emergency response workers, and they understand that uh, there are hazards in their jobs that can impact, have an impact on their physical and emotional well-being. Our members would suggest that under existing legislation, 
emergency workers who come forward with claims of PTSD already receive the benefit of the doubt when they are engaging in the types of stressful work surrounding emergency situations. Now, given the existing practice, one could also wonder why automatic assumption uh, of the claim for emergency workers is in fact needed. Nevertheless, RCC does not wish to diminish the, uh, the trauma experienced by frontline uh, emergency workers. And our members also recognize that uh, this was a promise made by the government in the lead up to the election campaign where uh, politics can trump policy at times. That said, now that we're beyond the election, we'd ask this committee to understand the problems that could be created by this bill and take the time to put forward amendments that would narrow the interpretation of the occupations that would qualify for automatic assumption of PTSD. More importantly, within a given occupation, our members would call on this committee to provide some clarity for members like mine as to which employees would qualify. For instance, uh, the list of professions that would qualify for automatic assumption include police, uh, paid volunteer and volunteer firefighters, paramedics, nurses, continuing care, uh, the list goes on. I know you're all very much aware of those. Under Bill 15, a person in a profession like nursing would receive automatic assumption of PTSD and uh, for those that are working in emergency rooms uh, where they deal with stressful and even traumatic events, we have no issue with that. Others though may work for years as administrators. Uh, some work for our members as occupational health nurses. Uh, they're RNs, uh, but they're working for a retail chain. Still others are at the end of their careers and they're choosing to work maybe in continuing care where they're not involved necessarily in the traumatic work that uh, I think this legislation was originally meant to, uh, to encompass. Each of these jobs, they do provide tremendous value to society, but not every one of them, in our opinion, should be considered for automatic assumption of PTSD. <coughs> Excuse me. You can make the same argument for other occupations that would also be covered by this bill. Members of these professions may move into roles where they would spend good portions of their careers far removed from the stress experienced by their colleagues working on the front lines. RCC would not dispute that there are people in all professions who suffer from stress and even PTSD. However, if their PTSD is caused by their life at home, it should not be the, the employer who would automatically have to pay uh, for their employee's treatment. And obviously, you know, paying through WCB, it still affects the employer's premiums. This legislation will obviously cause uh, employer premiums to increase uh, for some employers. Further troubling is the fact that this bill will allow any future uh, additions to the list of professions that automatically qualify to be made via regulation. Every profession can make legitimate claims to incidents where there is a stressful work environment, and our members worry that politicians will be subject to pressure to constantly expand the list. Such additions to the list could also diminish the pressures, uh, diminish the pressures of the jobs the, that are experienced by those in the professions that are currently on the list. We do not want to cheapen uh, the impact of those that are working in what we would consider to be emergency professions. RCC also disagrees with the notion that this legislation will speed up the process to allow those in need of treatment to get it in more of an expeditious manner. As far as we see it, it will not be the case as the reporting and paperwork at the front end will not change. The only real change is that in making an assessment, any mention by the person in question that their stress is caused by problems in their personal life will not affect whether or not they receive the benefits. With, this, uh, with regard to the other aspects of the legislation, uh, RCC uh, would like to see government tighten the legislation uh, uh, through the uh, regulation process to regulatory process to ensure that only psychiatrists or psychologists can diagnose PTSD and we also believe that there should be time limits for the eligibility to qualify for automatic assumption for such benefits. And as an aside to this legislation, uh, given that the government uh, has taken steps in recent years to create a business friendly environment, and we do applaud that, and reducing costs to employers, if this legislation passes, uh, it's obvious that there will be additional costs to employers. There may be costs related to employee issues that have nothing to do with their work environment, and yet employers will be paying. 
This being the case, if government does pass Bill 7, then we would hope and expect for them to come forward with a plan to provide employers with equal cost savings elsewhere to make up for these increased costs. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Cormier. Uh, questions? Mr. Orrell. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Mr. Cormier. Um, I, I listened with interest about the premiums. Um, if, um, we'll use a nurse, for example, was working in an emergency room for 10 years and experienced uh, the trauma and the, the, the problem that caused the PTSD, left that job, went to another job, um, who would be responsible to pay the premiums if they went off on PTSD with presumptive effects? I don't know if, and, and maybe I'm wrong when I'm assuming this, but I haven't heard yet where the premiums would be paid by the employer. I, I assume that the premiums would be paid by the government. Is that not what your impression is? Well, and again, you know, the, the first thing that I want to make clear is that I'm not an expert in this by any means, and the legislation as I've seen it, um, even in chatting with some of the experts that we deal with with the Office of the Employer Advisor, um, they're very unclear as to what this legislation will mean. So again, that's why I've tried to be very careful in prefacing my comments to say it's, it's not that we're saying no, this is awful, this shouldn't happen. What we're saying is that we're very concerned that under the wording that's in the current legislation, it just seems like it will be a, a bit of a free-for-all that if you're in one of the professions that's listed, you're in, you know, regardless of, you know, getting into some of the questions that, you know, even the question that you just asked, I don't know. Um, our members are simply concerned that it could end up being a situation where, you know, you have uh, a nurse working for a large retailer that, you know, maybe there's a situation where they had a situation at work from 10 years ago. Should that apply? Not sure. Uh, again, we'd like to see some more consultation on that uh, to allow some of our members to dig in on that. Um, on the other hand, you know, we, we do want to ensure that it doesn't reach a situation where you have someone who hasn't worked uh, in a in a traditional nursing environment, I, I, I'm just using nurse as an example, but for the other professions as well, where they've been an administrator for 30 years uh, and they're having issues in their home life. You know, as sad as that is, that shouldn't be the responsibility, that, that's not something that uh, should be the responsibility of the employer uh, as far as, you know, paying to, uh, to uh, help care for that person when they're off work. So long roundabout answer to your question, I, I apologize, that we really don't know and that's part of the reason why we thought it was incumbent on us to be here today. You know, we don't represent too many emergency professions. Uh, we don't represent any, but the fact is it would still have an impact throughout the system. Thank you, Mr. Cormier. Thank you very much for your presentation also. Thank you. So we did have one cancellation, uh, Judy Lewis, that is on the list uh, did cancel, so we're a little, a little catching up on time here. Is Richard Bigger here? No? How about Deborah Fortune? Deborah, if you're prepared to, to start, yeah, please come forward. It's always nice to have people here early. Thank you very much. So thank you for coming, and you know the format, 10 minutes for, for presentation and five minutes for questions. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, thank you very much for letting me speak today. Um, my name is Debbie Fortune, and I'm an advanced care paramedic in Cape Breton. Excuse my emotion. This is a very um, personal issue for me, so I will try to be professional here, but sometimes it gets away from me. Um, I'm not just a paramedic, but I'm also a wife and a mother of three children. And those three things that I am are extremely pertinent as to why I'm here today. You see, my colleagues are suffering, and they suffer daily. I could tell you about my 27-year-old colleague and friend who is no longer a working paramedic. She came to me one day on her way to work for coffee. Five minutes into that conversation, I had to call her supervisor to inform him that she would not be reporting to her shift because I was taking her to crisis. 
she was put off work for a week, told to see her family doctor, and her family doctor agreed that she had mental health uh, issues and put her off for a month. And uh, she couldn't see a psychiatrist yet. They put her on the wait list um, for mental health. This was a year ago that I took her to crisis. She is still waiting to see a psychiatrist. In that time frame that she was off, a period of six months, her family physician repeatedly put her off in one month increments awaiting her mental health assessment. During that time, she uh, applied for and received uh, short-term disability coverage. However, that was um, taken away because she didn't have a proper diagnosis from the appropriate medical um, uh, appro um, provider. Um, Six months after she went off work, she quit. She told me that she would rather not work because she couldn't fight anymore. She couldn't fight with short-term disability. She couldn't fight with WCB to open the claim and fight with them to get approval and to see benefits. She now currently works at a Tim Hortons and is on the verge of bankruptcy. She has yet to see a psychiatrist. She has yet to receive any help for the actual reason that she went, did not report to that shift that day. Mental health system in Nova Scotia, I'm sure you are aware, is in crisis itself. We see it daily in our profession, and I see it daily with my loved ones. Um, I apologize. Sorry. Um, the focus group that I took part in highlighted the problem of stigma, and that is definitely a component. However, as I told the research group, it is not only the factor that leads to the few paramedics coming forward. I honestly see nothing in this bill, nothing that relates to any of the information that we provided in the focus group. Um, I haven't mentioned that my husband is also an advanced care paramedic. Jason has not worked since May 9th of 2014. It took an ambulance ride and the fear that he was having a heart attack to finally start his journey towards getting help. We waited 15 weeks, almost four months, for short-term disability to approve his claim after we appealed it. At the same time, a WCB claim was submitted because we truly felt that WCB was the proper benefit. WCB never responded. They repeatedly reported or stated that there was no accident report submitted by the employer. In January of 2015, finally, we contacted the Pictou County injured workers and Mary Lloyd began the process of helping my husband and I. Jason had a diagnosis from two separate family doctors of PTSD. His claim was denied based on the fact that he did not have a psychiatrist's diagnosis. When he finally saw a psychiatrist in late 2015 and was diagnosed with PTSD from a WCB uh, approved psychiatrist, his claim was once again denied because the last call he did, the one to break the camel's back, was in the opinion of his caseworker not traumatic enough. We appealed again and Jason was forced to recall as many horrific and traumatic calls as he could for the board. Finally, in 2016, he was approved. During the time between going off and his WCB approval, Jason was seeing a social worker who provided EMDR treatment. EMDR treatment is a specific treatment for PTSD. It's called, it is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It is very specific for PTSD. We were paying $150 every two weeks for him to have this treatment as that social worker um, was not approved by our medical plan. This treatment that we found was truly helping and once WCB took over, he was told that she was not one of WCB's practitioners, so he should then stop. But WCB does not have anyone providing that treatment. There is very little expertise in PTSD, diagnosis or treatment in this province. And being in 
Cape Breton, we are also at a disadvantage because we do not have access. I asked his caseworker about sending him to an in-house facility, such as Homewood. The response we got was, it is not cost effective to spend that amount of money on a person without a guarantee that he will return to work. Does that sound like this is about my husband getting better? Does this sound like it is about increasing his quality of life? Or is this just simply about getting him back into the workplace in any capacity, whether that be a minimum wage job or whatever, WCB suits? In our profession, we only have three years to get back to our position, or it is gone. Jason was two years off before WCB approved him, and he is still waiting for any real treatment. In June, he saw a psychiatrist that works for WCB. He is to determine in a one-hour appointment whether Jason is to return to the workforce in some capacity or not. One hour to determine the direction of his life and the life of my family, my three children. It is October and he has not yet received a report from that psychiatrist. My husband gave 20 years to the citizens of Nova Scotia. This injury took his occupation a huge part of his identity. We were separated for a period of time. He lost time and quality of relationship with his wife and with his children. I lost my partner. My children will never know their father as the man I married. We have given and lost so much and we are pleading for someone, anyone, to care and to help. I appreciate this attempt at this legislation. It is long overdue that we are recognized as first frontline, first responders. But if you actually look at what is being put forth, you are taking a five-year limit and you're decreasing it to a two-year limit for those people such as my friend right now, who is one year out and still waiting to see a psychiatrist. So she has one year left, according to this new legislation. One year left, and she still hasn't seen anybody. So you're taking that five-year limit and you're, you're decreasing it to two? Also, this presumption, not assumption. It, this bill doesn't help anybody with the diagnosis. My husband still needed to prove it and still needed to have that diagnosis, and it took a lot of time to get that diagnosis. So there needs to be an assumption here that you're a paramedic or you're a first responder or a nurse or a social worker. That you, there has to be an expedition of care for these people. I truly believe that if my husband had received the care that he needed in a timely manner, he would be working again. And believe me, he wants to work again. We do this type of job because this is the kind of people we are and it becomes a part of who we are, not just what we do. And he has lost that. And it breaks my heart. And I'm sorry if this is not the forum for this much of, anyway, <laughs> sorry. Thank you very much. Can I just say, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Yep. Just one other uh, portion to this. I accompanied my husband to his meeting with his caseworker because he has a lot of anxiety. And as he sat there shaking and wringing his hands, unable to speak at the time, I stated that he had had some questions that he needed cleared up, but he was unable to ask, so I asked if I was able to. His caseworker stated that she wanted to hear Jason's words and did not think that my enabling him was helpful for his condition. We need people that understand this injury because this injury isn't a physical one. This isn't the same, you can't treat it the same way as you would treat an injured back. So the caseworkers that are dealing with this should have some knowledge and expertise in this field. I truly believe that. Thank you. Sorry. And thank you very much. And you should never have to apologize again for, for you know, showing emotions in this room at all. It's important. So thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Debbie, for, for coming. Uh, all this way, and and uh, and I think it is important that uh, that this committee hears uh, directly from people like yourself about your personal experience, your colleagues' uh, experience, and, and your family's experience, and your husband. And uh, I hope uh, that through 
uh, listening to you that the committee, uh, that the government understands uh, that the need to make sure that this legislation reflects um, what people are going through uh, on, you know, in the communities across uh, across Nova Scotia, and, and uh, you have my commitment to try to make sure that they understand uh, exactly uh, what's at stake here. Uh, and uh, and I just want to say I appreciate you coming here to, to to give us your side and the experience that you and your family's gone through. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Appreciate it. Uh, Richard Bigger, is Richard here yet? No. Um, Sean Waters. So we're caught up on a few a uh, few things here. Um, we do have uh, a few bills, uh, I believe, with no representation that uh, we could um, we could look at right now. Bill 17. Um, and Bill 19 are both um, both here for us. Uh, if we could have some motions uh, for those bills, Mr. Irvin. Mr. Keith Irvin. Next one. <laughs> here we go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I move the bill number 17, Solemnization of Marriage Act, be referred back to the House without amendment. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary minded? Motion is carried. Bill 17 will be forwarded to the Committee of the House, whole House. Uh, bill number 19, an act to amend various consumer protection statutes. Do we have a motion on that? Mr. Irvin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I move that Bill Number 19, an act to amend various consumer protection statutes, be referred back to the House without amendment. So we have a motion on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary minded? Motion is approved. Bill Number 19, an act to amend various consumer protection statutes, will be referred back to the House without amendments. Uh, we have, I believe, some folks here. Uh, Sean Waters, Kevin Johnson. Kevin, if you'd like to come forward. Um, we, uh, we welcome people that are a little early. It's nice for us. We're caught up on our schedule. And um, it, uh, it means a lot that we can keep on time. So appreciate you being here. So the format's uh, pretty straightforward. If there's anything we can do to assist, let us know. But it's 10 minutes for presentations and five minutes for questions. And uh, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the Law Amendments Committee, uh, fellow presenters and members of the gallery. The issue is uh, fair, proper, and timely treatment of first responders who are injured in the line of duty. First responders who sustain post-traumatic stress injuries need to be supported, need to be provided proper access to the care they require. Post-traumatic stress disorder has now been shown to be a physical injury. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not a mental illness. It's not something uh, we're born with. It's, it is a mental injury. If a person suffering from PTSD, there is uh, now proof to show that the brain is actually injured and that areas of the brain are changed drastically due to that injury. This has even been shown uh, in October 2016 here in Halifax at the Minister of Labor's conference on PTSD in the workplace. Come here now and I could show you all kinds of stats, studies, reports, etc. But anyone can do that. I want you to see a little into the life of an injured first responder. I've always been extremely active in the community as a volunteer, engaging in outdoor activities, and within my chosen career as a police officer. Thank you. On April 30, 2009, that all ceased for me. On April 30, 2009, a forest fire started near Herring Cove Road in Spryfield. That fire grew to a wildfire that consumed eight homes and displaced several thousand residents under evacuation. 
On that day, I was the only first responder on two dead-end streets in the Yorkard area. As the fire surrounded the area, burning everything in its path, and after getting eight people and several pets to safety, I myself became trapped. I made the resolution that it was the end, and I will carry that with me for the rest of my life. I obviously eventually did get out and returned three more times into the flames before later being rushed to emergency. I sustained life-changing injuries. Life as I knew it came uh, it will never be the same. <clears throat> I have both physical injuries and severe PTSD. I missed the job every day. I loved what I did and the difference I made in my community. I was once asked if knowing what I know now would I still have gone into the fire. Without hesitation I say yes. Someone would have died that day, and that would have been a bigger burden for me to carry. I have been recognized publicly by my, for my actions, and especially took pride in being awarded a commendation for heroism in May 2006, right here in the legislature by the Attorney General at the time, Diana Whalen. I was off for approximately 13 months before returning part-time, but to be honest, I should not have been there, as I was still in very bad shape. Three months after returning, a freak accident occurred with something exploding, resulting in a total loss of vision in my left eye. Now please keep in mind that the police department I worked for is not part of the WCB coverage, but contractually and via the law, the department must provide equal or superior coverage. They did provide some coverage for a while, but they also made it quite clear they did not know how to deal with me and with my PTSD. PTSD manifests in many ways, in some, uh, in, it's sort of like a perfect storm. For me, it was depression, anxiety, panic attacks, punk, uh, bunkering, hypervigilance, and avoidance, to name a few. I was not on any medication prior to the fire, but was on a large cocktail of medications following the fire. <clears throat> I was in counseling and under several doctor's care, who have all well documented everything since the day I was injured. I also went on a transplant list in relation to my eye. I could barely function on a good day, and good days were far and few between. Some people want to use the analogy that if I was to break my leg, I would get the help my, for myself, and that this is the same type of situation. If I was to break my leg, I still have my brain to advocate for myself and assist in getting what I need. When you are injured with post-traumatic stress disorder, you lose the ability to think, to advocate, and the ability to get the help you need. When you add the stigma associated with having a mental health injury combined with how people are treated, it is only then that you understand why we are losing first responders to suicide at such an alarming rate. I had no ability to advocate for myself, and I bunkered. That inability to advocate for myself left me spiraling. In the end, in 2013, my employer terminated me, terminated my pay, terminated my medical coverage, terminated my access to counseling. They stripped me of any dignity I had left. Can you imagine being on all those medications, being in counseling and stopping it immediately, as well as losing your pay? I was terminated by the employer even though my doctors and surgeons all concurred that I was unable to work. It took me nine months to get partial pay started again, but to this day I have yet been denied both medical coverage and counseling. I lost virtually everything that I owned. I spiraled even further and went into dark places no one could ever have convinced I would go. I was suicidal. That was my thanks for putting my life on the line, rescuing eight people and almost dying. Understand that it is not easy for me to be here speaking today, and also understand that two years ago, this would not be possible. In March of 2016, this furry little chocolate lab at my feet came into my life through the Mental Health Foundation of Nova Scotia via their first responder service dog matching program. Maggie is her name, and she was prescribed by two doctors. She does things for both my physical injuries and my PTSD. What I have gone through after the fire, while well, I'm not alone. All we need to do is watch the media reports of similar stories, how first responders are being treated both locally and nationally. I guarantee that is only a fraction, as most are unable to talk or, in hi or, or are in hiding. That combined with those living in fear because they know if they say something, they will meet with the same fate as some of their colleagues and have things either cut or terminated. We are not looking for, as some refer to it, Cadillac care. 
We are looking to be treated fairly, receive treatment, and access to treatment in a timely fashion. And above all else, the understanding that PTSD makes, takes away the person's ability to advocate for themselves. First responders do not have the ability to look after themselves when they're in this situation. Perhaps if this legislation had been in place in 2009, I would not have had to, an almost nine-year battle that several times almost saw me losing my life. Maybe then I would have received the proper care and not have to fight years for it. As for this being the flavor of the day, PTSD has been around for a long time and under various names. With education and research, we understand it better now. The reality is that it is not a vacation not some cool club. This is a serious injury that is taking people's lives. There is a whole set of tests and criteria trained psychologists and psychiatrists must follow in order to, take, to make a diagnosis. If someone has this diagnosis, it is time to stop the institutional betrayal, time to stop re-victimizing all these first responders. We need a level of support that ensures those that put their lives on the line are looked after when they can't look after themselves. Stop the stigma, encourage them to come forward, allow them to get the help that they desperately need. Paramedic Kevin McCormick, New Brunswick. Corporal Trevor O'Keefe, RCMP Newfoundland. They were not so fortunate and it seems did not feel that they had the support or feeling that they could come forward for help. They resorted a few short weeks ago to taking their own lives. They, and sadly in excess of over 40 other known first responders, have taken their lives this year alone. I'd ask that we make the legis this legislation in their memory, in memory of all those who have needlessly we've lost. I'd ask everyone here today to think about those lost heroes, and I ask just for a moment of silence for them, please. If someone puts their life on the line day in and day out and they are injured, then they should not be forgotten about, be forced to fight for coverage, be told to go away, be made to feel ashamed, to feel that taking their life is the answer. Therefore, I ask you to please help ensure we lose no more first responders. Give them what they rightly, rightfully have earned, legislate that if a first responder is diagnosed with PTSD, that no matter who the employer is, they by law must look after that injured hero. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Um, this is sometimes a difficult place to come into, and it takes brave people sometimes just to come here and speak, let alone heroes and people that have gone through what you've gone through. So I really do appreciate what you've said here tonight, uh, today. Uh, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Dave, the Honourable Dave Wills. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's great to see you here again, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I just want to say uh, it's been an honour to, to, to meet you over the years and, uh, and truly to, uh, to see uh, the type of person that you are going through this experience that you've had and diagnosis that you've had. Um, and you still managed to come to uh, a law amendment's Committee, which I know uh, a few years ago would not be something that you would have done. It wouldn't have been um, possible. On a piece of legislation that ultimately, uh, right now as it sits, doesn't directly pertain to your profession. And, uh, and I think uh, those who have presented before you, those who are... Uh, those who can't be here and... and and are unable to speak for themselves appreciate what you're doing and uh, I hope that the, the community listens uh, to the impact that this has on people's lives and, uh, and, and do the right thing and make sure that this legislation does uh, hopefully uh, put a stop to some of the suicides that we've seen. So thank you, uh, Tim. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much and thank you, Mr. Wilson, for that comment also. Uh, 
Thank you. Okay. We'll go to our next presenter. Appreciate it very much. Thank you very much for your time. Up, up. Richard Bigger. Is Richard here yet? No. Uh, Sean Waters. Uh, Rachel Barber. Dean Tupper. Okay, this is my last one on the list. Terry Chapman. Terry, come on down. Thank you very much. Appreciated the fact that you're here a little early so that we can continue moving on. It looks like we'll probably be having a recess uh, at some point in time, but so the floor is yours. If there's Thank anything you. we can do to assist, let us know. You have 10 minutes for presentation and five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Uh, Chair, members of the uh, Law Amendments Committee, my name is Terry Chapman. I'm the CEO and business manager of the International Union of Operating Engineers Local 727. I'm also a 29-year paramedic. Uh, my office represents uh, approximately 900 full-time, part-time, temporary term, additionally 12, uh, 250 unionized casual employees who are ground ambulance paramedics, and a dozen or so paramedics and RNs who work in the Life Flight program. Uh, the Workers' Compensation Board, which was kind of kicked off in 1915 by its own admission, has not been keeping up to, its, to the requirement of the people. It's been, not been keeping up to a mandate. It's been allowing, or, or legislation has been allowing it to go forward with work programs, back to work programs, job safety programs, making sure that, not that it's not important, but making sure that if I'm a carpenter, I don't fall off a roof, or if I do fall off a roof, somebody will fix me and get me right back to the friggin' roof. Um, and, and I suppose that's required and that's good, but there's been a, a serious lack in, in anything going forward to protect those people who can't protect themselves. And quite honestly, being a paramedic, similarly, I suppose, to a police officer or fireman, is a proud profession. And historically, and, and Brother Wilson can attest, back in the day, should we go to a coworker and say we felt weak or we were disturbed, we'd be ostracized. And, and so that didn't happen. And, and over 36% of the current day paramedics are from that, from that era. And I would estimate that at least 10% of them suffer greatly every day. Uh, when myself and my staff, we've attended meetings with WCB, with members who have been affected uh, and diagnosed with varying degrees of PTSD, who are in dire need of help. And, and at certain points, both the WCB people, the, this employer who was uh, Emergency Medical Care Incorporated, my office and the health and wellness office all agreed that something had to be done. That this has been going on for a very long time. In 2014, when uh, Mr. Wilson, uh, to my left, made the attempt to address the need for this, the, the government shot him in the foot, said, no, you, you can't do this. They basically turned their back on it, which was turning their back on, on everyone who's affected. These people who are affected are brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, family members, friends, our children, our grandchildren. They're everyone. Uh, Debbie Fortune, who, who presented earlier, who's, who's a friend and a fraternal sister, uh, I, I can't personally speak to her issue because she's living it, I'm not. But we see it every day. Literally every day there are uh, a list of about a hundred people who are our people who try to get a hold of us or try to get referral or try to get us to help them do something. When someone's saying, oh, I don't see you, I don't see blood running out of you, so you, you can't be that sick, go to work at Tim Hortons. And, uh, you know, the, the government, uh, the, the constituents who are afflicted with this, uh, who committed suicide, suicide, who might not otherwise have chosen that pathway from their, from their miseries is sad. The, the number is sad. It, it makes me sad personally. 
uh, and, and it's really sad that there's no retroactive clause in language or a go-forward principle or a button that we can push to alleviate the anguish of the families who have been affected by the death of a loved one, especially PTSD or, or mental illness. Because up to the point, from the cases we know, and I'll give you an example. One morning, two o'clock, and this is AM, a paramedic called me and he was weeping, he couldn't talk. I went to his house, I took him to the QE2 Health Sciences Center. They said, go home and be well, don't worry. Six o'clock the next morning, I was told he, he hung himself. That didn't have to happen. The 40 people from here in this year and the 127 people since Mr. Wilson tried to, tried to help these people who have died didn't have to happen. And while we, the presenters before me share the same story, they share the same sentiment, basically the same principal discussion or plea to this committee. Uh, it goes further than I'll agree with them, the language dictates. And, you know, the language says paramedics, fire people, police people, you know, people who deal with other people in a sad state. It needs to be broadened, and it needs to be that myself, a 29 or so year paramedic, who can't work anymore because I can't go to work, I can't face what might happen today. So now I work for uh, Mr. Cormier's group and I'm selling jeans and something triggers that. I should be covered. It is an injury. It doesn't matter if I'm selling jeans. And specifically to one point, in the language it says paramedics will be covered and it says paramedics as defined by the act. I just want to toss this in. Uh, the act says paramedics who are practicing paramedics. Uh, the communication center uh, dispatch people, they're paramedics when they're hired, but they don't have to keep their license to maintain and to be an employee, so they should also be given consideration of that. But I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to drag on your day. I know we've all been here a long time, but uh, this, is a, this is a serious thing, and, and this affects hundreds of people. Me, Debbie, her husband, their children, many, many other people. And there are people who actually tell us, I would really like to get help, but I'm afraid to because then I can't feed my family. There are people who say, I'd really like to get help, but I'm afraid I won't be diagnosed efficiently, properly, or expediently, and therefore won't be able to feed my family. When anybody, and I do know them, when someone is afflicted with a, a mental illness, PTSD, um, I'll say specifically in this case. And they're first of all worried to death that if they tell somebody, their world will crash. They're, they're, they don't act like themselves. They continue to go to work because they have to. They don't function well. They don't function well at home. 90% of them have issues at home about 40% on average just from what our phone calls and comments from the brothers and sisters that we deal with uh, have marital issues after the first year and are separated or divorced after a year and a half or two. And while I realize that Workers' Compensation Board shouldn't come to our homes and hold our hands and tell us to be happy and marry someone you like better, it is a responsibility of the after effect and it is a responsibility of someone. And uh, while I, I do appreciate the government's initiative in, in maybe considering language as might be before us, it needs to be broadened. It, it needs to be tailored, and there needs to be a, spe a spectrum of events that can happen for each person, not simply the cookie cutter. They're not cattle going to the milking parlor, they're, they're people and each person is individual and different, and each different situation is unique. And rather than go through all the other notes and everybody, what everybody else said, I'll leave it at that, and I'll thank you very much for your time. Thank you, <coughs> excuse me very much, Mr. Chapman, um, for your 
again, very real comments on exactly what this is uh, at. Mr. Wilson. How you doing, brother? I'm good, sir. How are good. you? Um, when this uh, when this legislation came forward, uh, definitely I, I was uh, you know I've said it before I've mixed emotions on on uh, on how we're hopefully uh, will achieve uh, what I think and what is needed um, in the end. Um, a lot of uh, the details um, in Bill Seven will be uh, generated through regulations, uh, and the government is indicating it'll be the next over the next year. Um, have have the government reached out to you, uh, to your organization, uh, indicating that they'll um, there'll be a, an opportunity for you to help create those regulations and and hopefully play a role in in educating uh, the people that will be writing uh, the clauses and that will present them to the minister, that will be presented to cabinet to, uh, to, to give uh, approval for. Has that happened? And if not, are you willing to uh, play a role? No, that, that, as you describe it, as I understand it, has not happened. We attended a focus group, and they said they would share our concerns. That was it. And I've not been invited, but I would welcome that opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chapman. Appreciate very much the fact you're here today to share Thank your you. views. Uh, I'll go back. Is Richard Bigger in the room? No. Sean Waters. Sean, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we've been juggling around the order here a little bit. It's nice. It's, we're just keeping one step ahead. It works out perfectly. So uh, the, pro, the format is 10 minutes for presentation and five minutes for questions. So. As long as you're comfortable, there's nothing we can do for you. The floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for allowing me the uh, chance to come here and speak today. Uh, I was a part of the research uh, group that was funded or uh, set out by the Department of Labor, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Sean Waters. I've been a paramedic with Emergency Health Services for close to 15 years. Um, operational stress injuries to me are unique in the way that you can't see them with an x-ray or feel them with palpation and you definitely can't hear them with a stethoscope. I love being a paramedic, I love my job, I was very blessed to have such a great career for many years. I didn't understand what an operational stress injury was until I myself was affected by one. After I started losing copious amounts of time from work for sleep deprivation and panic attacks, it was time for my family doctor and psychiatrist to talk to me about what an operational stress injury was and how it related to me as a field paramedic. After a short period of time, I proceeded back to work doing the job that I love. I found myself four shifts in on an ambulance when I started having the reoccurring problems, panic attacks, sweats, and anxiety. Even though medically I took care of myself and have a very comprehensive medical background, I found myself fired from my job for using excessive, excessive use, sick time use. <clears throat> I still sat, found myself fired. I lost my job. My union was incapable of dealing with this PTSD issue. I was denied WCB benefits under the current policy as it relates to operational stress injuries. Sorry. It's not a problem. Devastated and confused, I thought, how could this be? How, how could I be robbed from my job and my career? My, my felt like my identity was stolen. Through colleagues, I found Tema. Tema pays for my psychiatrist who is working with the RCMP in their PTSD group. I'd like to thank Dave Wilson for 
under the NDP power for trying to bring this legislation to power. I feel blessed to be sitting here today with the help of the Honourable Carla McFarland, Tim Houston, and Pat Dunn. This is a huge milestone for the province of Nova Scotia and the Liberal government should be very happy in what they're doing to make this a reality. Thank you for letting me speak today. Thank you, Sean. Questions? Ms. McFarland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Really nice to see you, Sean. You did great. Thank you. Um, over the last four years, three years, um, I've been able to really follow your journey. It's been very difficult. Um, with regards to the bill, though, uh, with specifics, I just want to know if there's anything, in your opinion, that has been left out. Well, I think there's myself and a dozen other people on a holding pattern. So I think any amendments that could be made uh, is to ensure that then people get treated fairly. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. Hi, Sean. Hi, Dave. You found it, did you? Yeah. All right. Not too hard to find down here. I appreciate you uh, you coming here and being here, and, and it's, it is extremely important when, uh, when the legislature uh, tries to bring forward changes in, in legislation and 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 trying to deal with issues like this that we hear from people who are affected by it. And I know it's not an easy thing to do, but uh, I have to say you, uh, you've you been doing an amazing job, not only you know here in Nova Scotia, but on a federal level, working with Tema and, and trying to uh, get our uh, our uh, MPs across the country to recognize this is, this is not, it's not contained in the borders of our province, it's straight across, uh, straight across our country. Um, I know that uh, you have been, uh, and there's always numbers out there on a number of, uh, of claims that have been denied uh, since 2014, and I believe you're, you're among one of them. Are you hearing uh, anything from WCB on, uh, you said you were on a holding pattern, um, about how this piece of legislation could help those who have been denied? Are you hearing anything? Uh, when it comes to WCB in, in, the, in that through, matter? Through the Workers' Advisory Program, uh, the lawyer, Bill McDonald, says that we are waiting for this legislation to change. Okay, great. Thanks, buddy. And, of course, on behalf of the committee, it's, it's nice, I'm sure, to come in here and see some friendly, familiar faces also, because it is sometimes an intimidating place, and I appreciate the, um, your being here and the courage to talk openly with us. Thank you for having so. Thank you. Uh, I'll go back to Richard Bigger once more. No? Uh, Rachel Barber. Dean Tupper. I see that we have um, uh, no other presenters here. I believe the next ones were supposed to be here by one o'clock. We'll take a, a 10 minute recess, uh, if you folks don't mind, until one o'clock. Thank you very much.
order. Welcome everybody back to uh, the Red Room and starting law amendments again on bill number seven, the Workmen's Compensation Act. Uh, looking for some witnesses. Richard Bigger. Uh, Rachel Barber. Rachel, welcome. Thank you, Rachel, very much. Appreciate uh, you being here. So uh, the process is uh, 10 minutes for presentation and five minutes for questions from the group. And uh, if there's anything we can do to help, let us know. If not, the floor is yours. Wow. Go ahead. Wow, I heard you guys were calling my name earlier. I was a little alarmed when the security guard downstairs told me, oh, you're Rachel Barber. They've been waiting for you. So, <laughs> um, I did bring some documents with me. Uh, you guys may already have seen this or be aware of it, but I just brought some information about the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder and how that diagnosis is made, because I do think understanding it to the very, uh, to a small extent at least, is important to understand some of the issues that I wanted to talk about with the current language. Um, can I just give them to you? I was told to bring 15 copies, and I did, so thank you. In any event, um, I'll introduce myself quickly. My name is Rachel Barber. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with the committee today. I really appreciate it. And I needed to take a moment as well to recognize the staff at the Office of the Legislative Council who have done some amazing work. I spoke with them, I think, three or four times last week, arranging for my moment to speak here today. And I was incredibly impressed with them. So any of you have an opportunity, please thank them um, on my behalf because they were remarkable. Uh, I'm here today speaking on behalf of the Office of the Worker Counselor. Uh, some of you have probably heard of us. Some of you may not have. Briefly, our organization was established by the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor in 2008. Our organization provides assistance, education, and advocacy for workers, all workers in Nova Scotia, um, and helping them navigate and learn about the workers' compensation and the occupational health and safety systems here in Nova Scotia. The bulk of the work we do is assisting workers, workers' compensation claims. So we've had a lot of experience dealing with injured workers in many different circumstances and situations where they're having difficulty coping with the workers' compensation system. And nowhere is that difficulty more pronounced than when a worker has been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. The diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder makes coping with any kind of bureaucratic system particularly challenging and difficult. And the experience we've had is significant in that we think someone with PTSD really needs to be um, helped with that system. We're here to do it. For those who know about us, we can try and help injured workers, those with PTSD or other injuries. Um, but for those who don't, the system is there and we believe Bill 7 will go a long way to making it easier for many workers with PTSD to get the assistance and benefits and coverage that they need. Ultimately, I think everyone here is very likely aware, Bill 7 changes the Workers' Compensation Act to include a presumption that post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosed in first responders arose out of and in the course of employment. This is very important legislation and in our view, it's an enormous step forward for the workers of this province. We participated in the consultation on the initial language proposed for the legislation, and we were very pleased to see the legislation that was presented um, for the readings in the legislature contained many of the suggestions that we had made. So we were very pleased with some of the changes. There remain, of course, several issues that we do feel we'd like to see 
altered. And I'll bring them to your attention, but first, I did have the information from the United States Veterans Affairs website handed out to you. On the first and second page of this information, you'll see it goes through the DSM-5 and the criteria for diagnosis of PTSD. The DSM-5, if you're not aware, is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual um, for Psychological or Psychiatric Diagnoses. It's essentially the book that explains all diagnoses of a mental health condition and it lays out the criteria for each of those diagnoses. In this case, I'd like to draw your attention to criteria A and C. So criterion A uh, essentially says what has to happen in order to have a diagnosis of PTSD, and it says the person must have been exposed to death, threatened death, actual or threatened serious injury, or actual or threatened sexual violence in a number of different ways. Criterion C, explains that avoidance of trauma-related stimuli after the trauma is a criterion for the diagnosis of this condition. So you can't have PTSD unless you avoid addressing or being reminded of the trauma or traumas that caused it. So those were the two main things I wanted you to be aware of while I explain why we had some concerns with respect to the information or the legislation as it's written. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the requirement for a prescribed di diagnostician within the language. I'll talk a little bit about the um, exclusion of employment decisions contained within the legislation, and a little bit about the time limit to submit claims as well. Briefly, the legislation as written allows we were pleased to see that the requirement for a diagnosis by a psychologist or psychiatrist was removed from the language of the Act. We felt that that was very important. It was originally presented that the PTSD must be diagnosed by a psychiatrist or a psychologist, and there are obvious problems with that. Um, ultimately, the estimates are that about 12% of people with PTSD will ever be diagnosed with PTSD. Most people don't seek help for this condition, and we think that by limiting the kind of diagnostician that would allow someone to obtain benefits by saying that, you know, in order to be eligible, you must be diagnosed by a psychologist or a psychiatrist, um, it's essentially a bar to claim for people and for individuals with injuries that already have enormous hurdles to overcome in order to access assistance of any kind, let alone benefits under the Workers' Compensation Act. So we're concerned that the legislation still allows a regulation to define a prescribed diagnostician. So it essentially says that we're going to tell you who can and cannot diagnose PTSD. That limitation exists nowhere else in the Workers' Compensation Act. There is no other kind of injury that, uh, that, that the Act or the law says must be diagnosed by a certain kind of provider or professional. Elsewhere in the Act, however, there are sections that do say the board or the employer or a number of other parties can require a worker to have a medical assessment if they think it's necessary. We think that that section of the legislation really doesn't belong there. Um, again, it creates a standard different for PTSD sufferers than for any other injuries or types of injuries in the Act. Uh, I was surprised as well to see the section 12.5, um, which says a worker is not entitled to benefits for PTSD if it's shown that PTSD was caused by a decision or action of the employer relating to the worker's employment, including a change in work, disciplinary, uh, discipline of the worker, or termination of employment. Now, having looked at the criterion A for the diagnosis of PTSD, I think we can all realize and recognize that the diagnosis requires a significant trauma, none of which would necessarily fall under a change in the work being performed, discipline to the worker, or termination of employment. Including this exclusion in the Act perpetuates the myth that 
I'd better speed up. <laughs> we'll, we'll give you a bit more time. <laughs> Thank you. It perpetuates the myth that PTSD is a diagnosis of complainers or people who have issues or anger towards other parties. That's not what PTSD is. This is not a necessary addition to the Act, and I think it's somewhat insulting to sufferers of PTSD to have that included. Lastly, I wanted to address the Section 83. I'm not sure if anyone's brought this up yet or not, but it essentially says uh, they've made changes to Section 83, which is the time limits to submit claims. And the time limit proposed for an individual with PTSD to submit a claim is within 12 months of their diagnosis. Now again, you need to remember one of the criteria for the very diagnosis of PTSD is avoidance. Um, dealing with the workers' compensation system, talking to your employer about PTSD, those are all very difficult things with PTSD, for PTSD sufferers to address. By limiting benefits to someone who has reported or filed a claim within 12 months of their diagnosis, you're limiting access to the benefits that a worker may be entitled to. We strongly feel that that time limit should be extended for sufferers of PTSD because they need that extension in order to be able to access benefits under the workers' compensation system. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Mr. Johns. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. So just uh, following up on your very last uh, comment there, what uh, what would you like to see as a timeline? 60, 60 months. 60 months? Five years, we think, would be reasonable. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, Mr. Oral. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, sorry about that. Um, just a thought of mine is, if for some reason a patient was diagnosed with PTSD 10 years ago, was denied a claim through WCB because, for whatever reason, and now with this new law in place, is there any stipulations in there that you know of that would allow that person to reapply for his benefits or because then you're past the two years, the five years, um, even if it's the five, if it's six years ago mm -hmm. um, and that person was, now it's presumed that that was the case. Maybe they ruled before somehow that it wasn't the case. There would should that be a provision in the, in the bill to, to make sure the people who um, historically would have had that diagnosis and, and for no reason, as it says, uh, I guess that, that's my question. Is there, is there something or mm -hmm. could there be? Uh, there's nothing that I'm aware of currently in the Workers' Compensation Act, and I know it by heart. So <laughs> um, I do see that the regulation or, or um, the section relating to the regulations within the current proposed legislation does indicate that the regulation will be able to prescribe a time frame in which people with old claims can apply. I can tell you that there would have been a lot of people in the past who were not covered by workers' compensation, um, who would have had PTSD because currently it requires a sudden and unexpected traumatic event, and the answer was constantly that if you are an ambulance driver or a first responder, you should, you know, these events are not unexpected. So that, that was the basis on which many claims were denied in the past. Um, I do feel that it is essential that people with claims in the past who have already filed and been denied have access to the benefits currently. That would, to me, be only justice. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Bourbon, appreciate your comments here today. Barber, sorry, Barber. My writing is horrible. <laughs> it works. I know who you meant. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this is my last call for Richard Bigger. We had him for 12 o'clock. Nope. So I would take that as a cancellation. Uh, Dean Tupper. Uh, Mr. Tupper is unwell today and won't be attending. Oh. Thank you very much. So that answers the last question that I'll have. Uh, it is now um, uh, one nineteen. Our next presenters are under Bill 15, the Environment Act. I don't imagine there is anybody here. Uh, Steve Thomas, uh, Brian Guilford, Dan Roscoe, or Christine Sonier. So we will adjourn until 
uh, one minute, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just uh, curious, do we still have, are, are we doing uh, number, bill number 27 as well as bill number 20, or 33 today as well? Uh, yes, we haven't got to those yet. Okay. Yeah. So saying that, we'll, uh, we'll adjourn until two o'clock. Thank you all very much.
We'll call the uh, committee to order. Uh, for the benefit of presenters, I would ask that uh, the committee uh, provide introductions and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Ms. Zan, please. Oh, hi, Lenore Zan, MLA for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Tammy Martin, MLA for Cape Breton Centre. Eddie Orl, MLA, Northside, Westmount. Good afternoon, Carla McFarland, MLA for Picto West. Mark Fury, I'm the chair, MLA for Lunenburg West. Benjamin Jessam here from Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Good afternoon, Suzanne Lonas Croft, MLA Lunenburg. Good afternoon, Bill Horn, uh, Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank. Hi, Hugh McKay, MLA for Chester St. Margaret's. Thank you very much. We're uh, speaking to Bill number 15, the Environment Act, and I would call upon our first presenter, Stephen Thomas. Just a reminder uh, to presenters, uh, we are allowing 10 minutes for purposes of presentations and an additional five minutes for purposes of questions and answers. Uh, some flexibility, uh, but certainly would uh, ask that we conclude in that reasonable period of time. The floor is yours. Great, thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin my, uh, my statements today by acknowledging our presence on unceded, unsurrendered Mi'kmaq territory. Uh, and thank you to the committee, to the members, uh, for the opportunity to speak today on Bill 15, the proposed amendments to the Environment Act and proposed cap and trade carbon pricing system uh, to be implemented here in Nova Scotia. I've uh, circulated my, my comments to the members here too, just in case. Uh, so my name is Stephen Thomas. I'm the Energy Campaign Coordinator with the Ecology Action Centre. Uh, we've been around the EAC since 1971. The EAC is Atlantic Canada's largest environmental advocacy organization. We now have over 5,500 members, 500 volunteers, 40 staff, and work across seven action areas. Uh, and so in, here in Nova Scotia, over the last 10 years, uh, we've done fantastic work uh, together as a province. Uh, on reducing greenhouse gas emissions by more than 30% below 2005 levels, uh, building out the green economy, building out that prosperity here in the province, uh, and creating hundreds of green jobs. Uh, however, I think Nova Scotia remains among the most carbon intensive regions in the world on a, on a per capita basis, uh, and has not yet legislated greenhouse gas targets beyond what's already been achieved. Uh, so that's gonna, um, going to be some of the focus that I, I hope to speak to today. Uh, the EAC and its many partners have been engaging in discussions, research, and advocacy on carbon pricing in Nova Scotia for more than three years. Uh, this work includes two carbon pricing forums with dozens of stakeholders from industry, academia, uh, advocates, and, and, and so on, and a six-part panel series on the possible opportunities and challenges of cap and trade here in Nova Scotia. In November of uh, last year, when the Nova Scotia government chose a cap and trade system over a carbon tax, a carbon levy, or some sort of hybrid system, uh, we worked with these stakeholders uh, to develop our analysis and position statements, which, which have circulated too. Uh, the Nova Scotia government signaled in its communications and the design option paper uh, that it will give carbon pollution credits away for free uh, to polluters uh, and create a system internal only to Nova Scotia. Uh, providing only about 20 participants in, in the province uh, and with Nova Scotia power at an advantage. Uh, whether or not greenhouse gas caps will represent an actual reduction in Nova Scotia's greenhouse gas emissions remains to be seen. We, we still don't know what those caps will be. Uh, to be clear, I feel that this legislation uh, allows for, for an ineffective and inequitable cap and trade system here in Nova Scotia. However, I also recognize that the legislation, Bill 15, which we're here to speak about, also builds a framework that leaves the door wide open uh, to a number of effective policies, um, such as collecting revenue, creating a green fund, and linking our cap and trade system to other jurisdictions. I'm pleased to see these opportunities reflected in the legislation, and I suggest that in the development of the regulations and of the policy, um, that the, that government take these opportunities and build a robust cap and trade system here in the province. So, getting to um, the specific recommendation that I, I hope to make uh, here today, 
uh, it, it, it's about the, the caps and it's about setting clear declining emission caps. So I feel that a strong cap and trade system must include greenhouse gas emission caps that actually ensure greenhouse gas emission reductions. Uh, the caps must be declining and must represent a reduction in greenhouse gases when compared with the business as usual case here in Nova Scotia. Specifically, uh, under section 112B of the bill, uh, we recommend that the language be added to ensure that greenhouse gas emission caps are declining and that they are more stringent when compared with Nova Scotia's business as usual case out to the year 2030. Uh, we feel that the, the long-term increase in stringency better complies with the federal government's carbon pricing benchmark, which, which brought upon this program, and gives Nova Scotian businesses more clarity for future planning. Uh, knowing what those caps are in the long term uh, better allows folks to make those investments and, and, and get there together. We hope that these emission caps will also give Nova Scotians the reassurance that the provincial government is committed to continuing a strong legacy in the province of greenhouse gas reductions and leadership on climate action. So when we move also to the, to the regulations and to the policy side of this, I think that uh, auctioning the pollution credits and collecting revenue uh, is a key part of what makes a cap and trade system uh, effective and equitable. Um, so we applaud the creation in the legislation of the Green Fund, uh, but I'm sure we'd all agree that the effectiveness of a Green Fund is severely limited if there's no money in that fund. Uh, no money to support low carbon programming, uh, and for the proposed Green Fund to have any funding to administer programming, the cap and trade system must collect revenue from polluters by auctioning pollution credits and establishing a floor price on those auctions. Uh, the same that's done in, in Ontario, Quebec and California, for instance. Given the proposed framework, polluters are being given a, a free ride under this program where all carbon pollution credits are being given away for free. Uh, and again, Nova Scotia Power at an advantage. We feel this must change. Uh, with the collected revenue, it's possible for us to talk about how we move forward together. Um, so I think that's key. I think it's possible to create critical support for Nova Scotia's transition to a prosperous, low carbon economy that creates hundreds of green jobs here in the province. Uh, the Green Fund can support low and middle income Nova Scotians by offsetting impacts that a cap and trade system may have. Uh, it can support low carbon initiatives like renewables and energy efficiency, support training and retooling programs for workers here in Nova Scotia entering the green economy and across Mi'kmaq communities. Uh, support for low carbon innovation and Nova Scotia businesses are also possible along with a, a long list of other things. I think in addition to collecting that revenue and auctioning those credits, uh, it's, it's a strong idea to, to link Nova Scotia's cap and trade system to other jurisdictions. Nova Scotia's cap and trade system is unusual in that it's proposed uh, that it's not linked with any other jurisdiction. This, this, I feel, will make for a volatile market and very limited opportunities given a province of less than a million people and an emissions trading system of about 20 participants. This is similar to the city of Ottawa setting up its own emissions trading system. We feel the most obvious choice would be for Nova Scotia to link with other Atlantic Canadian provinces or with Ontario and Quebec who are linked with California through the long established Western Climate Initiative or WCI. Uh, in May 2017, the EAC partnered on a commission study uh, that showed a reasonable case that investment under that linked system could flow to our province um, and to our region in general. Um, Linking to another system such as WCI will also, was also strongly supported uh, by industry and by other stakeholders who submitted feedback to create Nova Scotia Environment's What We Heard document on cap and trade, which was released just this August. Um, finally, I think it's critical that, that we engage in meaningful public consultation on, on this issue as something that stands to affect the province for, for some time and as a, an issue of climate change, as an issue of, of the action that we're taking on the climate crisis. Uh, I don't feel this issue is being discussed out in the open. The general public may not have been part of the very limited, focused and technical consultation that's taken place uh, with mostly industry and specialized stakeholders to this date. Uh, to better understand the need uh, for what emission caps to set and the best ways to utilize something like a green fund, I think broad public consultation must take place. So I'm happy to answer any questions that the members may have, and please feel free to, to contact me directly if you require any, any other information. Uh, it's, it's been great speaking so far. Thanks for your time and consideration.
Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Questions? Ms. Sand. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, when we, you're talking about uh, setting the emissions caps, uh, we noticed that there aren't really any hard caps in this bill. So did you have any amendments or recommendations regarding those specifically? So, so the language that, that I'd like to see included, the, the legislation allows for caps to be made. Um, I'd love to see that it stipulates that those caps are declining under the business as usual okay. case. So specifically, I'm speaking of Canada's biennial report the 2016 reference case that I have a copy of that I brought with me here today um, that, that sets that business as usual case with what Nova Scotia was already headed toward before this program or other programs under the pan-Canadian framework were, were, were being talked about. Um, so, so it's that, it's that stipulation that it must be declining and that it must represent a reduction under the business as usual case. I think that can get us, get us somewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Oral. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your presentation. As this sits right now, is there any way that this cap and trade system is going to limit greenhouse gas emissions? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. As this, the bill sits right now with the cap and trade, is there any way that it's going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? I think the, the challenge is that we don't know. I think the challenge is that we're having this conversation about this legislation without knowing what the caps are. And I and others are worried that the caps are going to be set too high and that the caps uh, will be set in a way that won't actually uh, lead to emission reductions. Um, it's, so it's, it's unfair for me to say that it won't, but I am worried that we're headed in that direction. And it certainly doesn't necessitate that we actually do reduce our emissions. So that's what I'm looking for here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Thomas, okay. for your time and attendance today. Great. Thanks very much. The next speaker is Brian Gifford. Welcome, Mr. Gifford. Thanks very much. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you. I really appreciate it. I'm here on behalf of the Affordable Energy Coalition. I'm the chair of that coalition. And I'm also on behalf of um, Kate Irving, who's a professor at St. Mary's, who helped in preparing this presentation but wasn't able to be here today. Um, so we have, uh, the purpose of our organization is to help low-income households deal with acute energy problems. And there are already a large number of, of low-income Nova Scotians who suffer from energy poverty. So we are making our recommendations in the light of that fact. Um, we have participated in some of the earlier conversations and we presented a brief uh, as a response to the consultations in May and participated in some of the panel discussions that um, the Ecology Action Centre and others have participated in. So we have been keeping track of what's going on with this bill. And we, at this point, want to make two recommendations. Um, I have circulated my uh, presentation to you so everybody should have it in front of you and you can follow along. Um, so the first recommendation is to amend section 112E to limit the granting of emission allowances to sale by auction with a floor price established by regulation. Right now, section 112E allows either giving them away or doing it by agreement or by auction. Our belief is that the only thing that will actually be effective in terms of creating, generating funds for the green, green Fund and also in terms of creating incentives for lowering greenhouse gas emissions is to actually auction off the allowances. And we believe that generating revenue through the sale of emission allowances is essential um, for those two purposes. So we, we welcome and support that section 112E 2B allows for selling emission allowances by auction or by agreement by emitters. However, we believe that it would be greatly improved by making uh, only the selling of emission allowances the only way to, to um, allocate allowances. So we recommend the changes that are shown in red. That would mean that 112E section two 
would become the minister may grant emission allowances by selling them at auction with a floor price established by regulation. So we are hoping that in your consideration you will recommend that change to the legislation before it goes back to the full uh, legislature. The second recommendation which is a little closer to our hearts, um, is to amend section 112.0 regarding the Green Fund to establish minimum percentages of the fund to be used to assist low and moderate income households. We applaud the government's announcement in March 2017 that it is funding energy efficient retrofits in low income rental properties at $2 million over this year and next. This is something that our organization has been pushing for for a number of years and we were very pleased to see that action is being taken on this. It's a smart way to assist low-income households while reducing greenhouse gas emissions, building on the success of the home warming program that installs energy retrofits in low-income homeowner households. Some of the green fund should be used to build on this success. We recommend using 50% of the revenue in the Green Fund to assist low and moderate income Nova Scotians in offsetting the costs of the cap and trade program, 20% of the Green Fund revenue to support greenhouse gas emissions reductions that, are directly, that directly benefit low and moderate income Nova Scotians like the rental program that I was talking about and the remaining 30% to support investments that more broadly assist in Nova Scotia's low carbon transition. How best to assist low and moderate income Nova Scotians in offsetting the costs of the cap and trade program depends in part on how much revenue is generated and what the expected impact of the cap and trade system is on their household costs. At this point, of course, those figures are unknown. If the impact and the revenue are relatively small, we recommend concentrating compensation on low income households who already experience energy poverty by establishing a universal service program that guarantees access to essential energy services regardless of income. If the impact and revenue are higher, we recommend a carbon tax benefit that would be a good mechanism for assisting both low and moderate income Nova Scotians in offsetting the costs of the cap and trade program. Some combination of these two programs may be more appropriate depending on the amounts of money and the impact, the amounts of money raised and the impact. Uh, there's a little more detail in the appendix which I'll briefly talk about later. There are many ways to support greenhouse gas emission reductions that directly benefit low-income Nova Scotians that build on the good work being done with the home warming program and the rental efficiency retrofit pilot program. These include doubling spending on those on the low-income in efficiency programs by expanding the rental program after the pilot demonstrates the best rental program design. Investing and training for people in low income and marginalized communities like African Nova Scotians and Mi'kmaq communities for work and green jobs and investing in improved transit in rural communities and in low income urban areas. So we recommend specifically uh, amending Bill 15 by changing 11202C as shown in red in, your, in the document before you. So the green, it would read, the Green Fund is established, the money and property in the Green Fund must be managed and used in accordance with the regulations for the following purposes. Oops. A, financing measures to reduce, limit or avoid greenhouse gas emissions and here's the change, including using 20% of the fund to support greenhouse gas emission reductions that directly benefit low and moderate income Nova Scotians. And then B would read the same as it does now. C would change to read at least 50% of the fund for financing measures to assist low and moderate income households in offsetting the costs of the cap and trade program. And then the rest would be the same. So we urge the Law Amendments Committee to recommend the two changes we've proposed to Bill 15 in order to increase the financial incentives for greenhouse gas emitters to reduce their emissions while at the same time creating funding to expand on the good work being done with low income homeowners and renters to help them meet their energy bills while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And then, so that's the, that's the main presentation, but if you look on the last page, uh, if you turn over and look on the last page, the appendix does have a little additional detail about some of the recommendations that we made, some of the ideas. So for instance, um, using at least 20% of the green fund to support greenhouse gas emissions, this is something that uh, Kate, Dr. Kate Irving has studied 
all over the world, these kinds of policies. In California, uh, we've talked about what they've done there, and they have actually done that. So it's not something that you would be breaking new ground in. It's something that's been established. It works well. It's a very smart way to adjust this kind of legislation and this kind of program so that it benefits the people who need it most. Doubling spending on low-income efficiency programs by targeting renters. This talks about, that little paragraph there talks about how much is currently being spent on low-income homeowners as well as renters. Um, as I say, those are very good programs. We fully support them and having a green fund with sufficient money to invest in those programs would only improve them. A universal service program, this we've been recommending for at least 15 years. <laughs> And the Green Fund is an opportunity to actually make that happen. It would, we recommend such a program for electricity and non-electric heat that will limit heat and electricity bills to 6 to 8% of income for low-income households to ensure low-income households have access to essential heat and electricity. I noticed in the debate about this bill when it was introduced, or at least in the second reading, that there was a lot of talk about this, about people, low-income people who are currently facing severe problems. At our recent meeting, one of our members said that in his county there were 100 people who are currently cut off of electricity because they can't afford it. And that's true across the province. So this is a program that would make sure that that doesn't happen. And then the carbon tax benefit, uh, that's been talked about in the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives budget, and uh, Alberta has, uh, set a, has created a very good example of one that we think would work well here. Thank you. I wasn't keeping watch of my time, so I don't know how long I took. <laughs> you were exceptional in timing. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Gifford. Uh, okay. Questions from committee members? Ms. Ann. Thank you. Um, are there any programs that you know of where it, it, it is a universal service program that helps everybody with the prices of electricity in places with jurisdictions where, where to heat your home and elect, with electrics is is really quite exorbitant, um, but yet still try and, and uh, convince people to use less to be efficient? Well, uh, universal service programs have been adopted in at least 30 jurisdictions in the U.S. Uh, Ontario has recently adopted a modified version of it. When uh, the, the term universal doesn't mean that everybody uh, benefits from the program. It means that people are not um, barred from using energy because they don't have the money to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So universal access for the people who can't afford to pay for it, basically, is what the term means. So there are, like I say, many jurisdictions that have pioneered this. They don't get 100% of the eligible people being involved. There's in the range of 40 to 50% who are actually involved, but it's a huge benefit for those people. Um, so yes, it does exist in many jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. And just another uh, question. So in your opinion, this, the cap and trade system that's being suggested here, where uh, the polluters are able to use their, um, their credits for free at this point in time to give it to other polluters, um, do, you, do you feel that this is going to be beneficial to helping reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Nova Scotia? Well, um, although it's not our primary focus, we do support action that does reduce greenhouse gas emissions because we're citizens like everyone else and uh, we think it's very important that we proceed in that direction. Um, as Stephen was saying, the current system as proposed uh, doesn't have enough detail to be able to tell if it will. but, but to your point of giving away free allocations, as we've argued in our presentation, um, that's a lost opportunity in terms of both creating a stronger incentive for the reductions to happen and also generating funds that can then help people who are currently mm -hmm. suffering from energy poverty as well as those who might in the future if energy costs do rise somewhat. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Burrell. I just wanted to ask, uh, as the bill stands, as you read it and evaluate it, um, is there any provision whatsoever for mitigating adverse impacts from a cap and trade system on people of lower income? Well, as Stephen was suggesting, uh, 
there are some very good things in the bill in that they allow a lot of different possibilities, and one of them is the Green Fund. Yeah. They don't, I mean, there's a very limited way in which they talk about actually generating money for the Green Fund by selling excess credits, possibly, or by penal through penalties that are charged, which I would suggest is likely to be a very small amount of money. Um, so the possibility is there, but under the current way that it's being looked at, being implemented, our understanding is that that possibility won't be realized. It's really good that the possibility is in there so you don't have to come back to the legislature and create a whole new bill if you change your mind and decide to do better. But, but the current proposal doesn't, it allows for it, but doesn't make sure that it happens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. The next presenter, Daniel Roscoe. Welcome, Mr. Roscoe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to uh, Minister Fury and committee members to uh, allow, affording me the opportunity to speak to you today on Bill 15 regarding the amending the Environment Act. It seems that I have the unenviable task of representing the private sector here today. So not what I expected, but I'll do my best. My name is Daniel Roscoe, and I'm here on behalf of Roswell Incorporated to speak in support of this bill. I have been an advocate for renewable energy and action on climate change in Nova Scotia since 2005. I helped found companies like Scotian Windfields and Sweb Development, and I have been involved in, over, in hundreds of wind and solar projects across the province, Atlantic Canada, and New England. And I have long insisted that a price on carbon was coming, so thank you to the government for not making a liar out of me. In general, Nova Scotia has been very progressive on renewable energy and energy efficiency through commitments such as the Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act, the COMFIT program, Solar City, and the formation of Efficiency Nova Scotia. These efforts have made significant changes to our electricity system and helped create a Nova Scotian industry with extensive experience. Many in this in industry, Roswell included, are now exporting their expertise to other jurisdictions that are trying to catch up to the progress that's been made in Nova Scotia. Throughout this effort, our, our focus has almost solely been on the electricity sector. Cus electricity customers have made investments in their future and have made great progress. However, other sources of emissions, emissions such as heating oil, gasoline, and natural gas have changed very little. While the intentions of policymakers and program creators were good, we have essentially subsidized those sources of energy over the past decade at the expense of the electricity system. A cap-and-trade program is the best way for Nova Scotia to recognize the substantial gains made in the electricity sector and restore the balance and fairness within the energy industry. A cap-and-trade program will be an essential tool for us to strive for continued economic growth while making sure that we meet our environmental targets. Regarding the legislation specifically, Bill 15 is, a, is an important first step but the effectiveness of this effort will depend on the regulations. To that end, we have a few suggestions. We are glad to see that the ability to charge for allowances is now considered in this bill, as it was originally indicated that they would be given away for free. I think everyone up here has spoken on this issue so far. Um, we encourage uh, the use of different rates and different applications for different sources. I think the the, the value of a cap and trade is that different industries have made different progress, therefore uh, different allocations and different prices can be used in order to, re to reflect that. Failure to do that will continue to subsidize imported fossil fuels in our province. It's hard to see how change can be incented when emission allowances are provided for free. It's also hard to see how it's in line with the pan-Canadian framework that this is all based on. Specifically, we suggest that for electricity, 
the existing costs that are on electricity bill to pay for things like efficiency in Nova Scotia and other uh, advances can be substituted with a price that's, up per, that's based on, uh, on, on a price per carbon. Uh, there are already costs in our electricity bill that are accomplishing the same things that the, that the, uh, the Green Fund speaks to, uh, so it can be swapped in without an impact on electricity consumers, and ultimately they're the ones that have made the, the, the change over the past 10 years. Um, for other sources uh, of emissions, they need to be able to catch up and to achieve the same types of emission reductions uh, that have been achieved by the electricity sector in order to really have fairness in our, in our industry. Also noted the fines associated with failure to meet the targets are not w well spelled out in this bill. And it's important that, uh, that together with the, with the cost for allowances and the cost for the fines that uh, they are significant enough to incent change from consumers. We're also glad to see that this bill now considers the ability to link our jurisdiction with others. And perhaps more than any, this is the most important point. Uh, us, um, we think that the Atlantic provinces should uh, should aim to have a similar system, and Nova Scotia is in a great position to be able to take a leadership role in that, uh, and that, that the Atlantic provinces should look to join with either the Western Climate Initiative or, uh, or Reggie, the, greenhouse, uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the U.S. Uh, as with an economy that's based and highly dependent on, on, uh, on exporting of products, we need to consider the challenges that going it alone or, or a made in Nova Scotia will present to exporters. If, the ex if exporters are required to, to, show the, uh, to take on the burden of showing equivalency with the markets that they're trading in, to show that our products in Nova Scotia have paid a fair amount for carbon, that, uh, other, that the same amount, an equivalent amount that, say, uh, people in, in New England uh, or people in Ontario are paying, um, that is going to be a significant barrier to trade and one that I, 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 I think that, uh, that needs to be considered carefully in the regulations, one that we definitely need to avoid. All in all, uh, we think this is an important step and we applaud the government for proposing this bill and it, sending a clear signal to Nova Scotians that we will have a province or economy-wide participation in hitting our climate goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Roscoe. Questions, Ms. Sand. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, just a, a question, and please pardon my ignorance, but uh, what is Roswell? What does Roswell do? Uh, we're a, a consultancy. We we uh, we help. Uh, we're literally helping uh, other jurisdictions, mostly in the Caribbean, uh, uh, achieve the same uh, same goals, same things we did here. So essentially, advising on wind and solar projects uh, for utilities and uh, industry uh, in developing economies to try to cut down greenhouse gas emissions. Absolutely, yes. And so have you been, you've been working with government for a number of years then? Have yes, you? I, I've been engaged, um, you know, through EGSPA and uh, through the development of Comfit Solar City. yes. So I, I've done a lot of this and, and I'm starting to do that elsewhere. Right, and, and were you concerned when Comfit was, was stopped, when it was... No, I, I wasn't. Um, I, I think that... Um, uh, Comfit had a goal of, of 100 megawatts, and it, it, it significantly surpassed that. Um, renewable energy has come a long way since uh, the development of the Comfit program. The prices for Comfit were set right after the financial collapse of, tw of 2008, uh, and they're almost twice what uh, the market rate for wind energy is right now. Um, the uh, wind and, and solar electricity are at a point where they can compete with with uh, traditional sources, um, so I, I don't advocate for um, um, uh, for uh, uh, for a more feed-in tariff style um, uh, policies, and, and I think the Comfit did w was a great program. It it made uh, it created an industry here. Um, the last procurement in this area for renewable energy was for the Atlantic Link that Amera did, and over seventy percent of the developers had Comfit experience. Yes. Uh, so that was uh, that was uh, that was you know 700 megawatts that would have been taken by uh, by by developers from outside of Atlantic Canada had Comfit not existed. And when you say that you're not in favor of more feed-in tariffs, why why not? I, I think it's at a point now where um, where um, renewable energy does not need to be subsidized in order to be competitive. Um, and I think that uh, from a government's perspective, we have to consider. Um, 
we, we have to consider our path to zero emissions. Um, and uh, we need more renewable energy, uh, but procurement mechanisms uh, do, don't need to be uh, based on a, on a, on a feed-in tariff style anymore to be successful. I think, they, uh, I think we need to find ways for more renewable energy, but, um, but that feed-in tariffs will not, uh, won't be the way that uh, will be best accomplished uh, uh, in light of uh, the, the Nova Scotian economy. Thank you. Just one, one more quick question. It just if I may, Ms. Zan, uh, revert um, to Ms. McFarlane, and uh, we will come back to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's very, it can become very complex and, and uh, there's a lot of details to it, but I just read something where Efficiency Nova Scotia said that electricity basically still has the you know, highest carbon intensity. So would you agree with that? Uh, I think that in, it all depends how it's looked at. You're right, it is complex. Um, uh, overall, I think electricity, uh, we, ha we have more, we, we've achieved our targets, and I think we've achieved the targets that are called for in the, in the pan-Canadian framework. There's a lot more work to be done, no question. Um, but uh, I, I think that, that can, the, the, those achievements in the electricity sector can be, made, uh, can be made through a more competitive process than a feed-in tariff. With respect to, um, to our targets, I think we need, uh, as the Ecology Action Centre called for, we need declining targets. We need to have a cleaner and cleaner grid. Bringing in Muskrat Falls will, will, will play a big part in that. And, uh, and I think uh, we need to look for creative ways in order to, uh, to achieve further reductions. Um, one of the things that electricity has uh, that can significantly benefit it, both from a, a greenhouse gas emissions perspective it, uh, it, the, and an economic perspective, is that the applications of electricity are far more efficient than the applications of fossil fuels. The, the common example are heat pumps and electric vehicles. Per unit of heat or per unit of driving, um, those technologies require far less energy to begin with. So even if it's a comparable intensity per unit of energy, they require a lot fewer units of energy to begin with, and that ultimately results in a, uh, in a, in a reduction in emissions. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We are beyond our allotted time, but I will allow Ms. San one final question. Thank you. Yes, actually, my, my question was going to be along those lines of, do you uh, support the EAC's suggestion that uh, that it be amended to say that the greenhouse gas gas emission caps are declining in uh, under Section 112B? I, I, I do support that recommendation. I think that's consistent with the framework that this is designed for. I think there's requirements in the pan-Canadian framework that there are declining balances from 2018 to 2023, I believe, in addition to meeting their 2030 targets. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, Mr. Roscoe, thank you for the time you've taken today. I know your schedule is busy. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate You're welcome. it. Next presenter, Christine Sagne. Welcome, Ms. Sagne. Thanks very much. Thanks to the committee for the opportunity to speak. I'm Christine Saunier. I'm the Nova Scotia Director for the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Before I begin, I too want to acknowledge that we are here uh, on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. In making this acknowledgement, I acknowledge the ongoing oppression and struggles for justice facing Indigenous peoples in our communities, and indeed the need to build relationships that genuinely follow in the spirit of peace and friendship treaties. And I start there because that's the spirit for which I present today. Climate justice needs to be at the forefront of our vision for addressing the climate crisis. The second point I want to make clear is that I do not come here in support of cap and trade. While a carbon price is part of the solution needed to tackle climate change and specifically emissions, there's plenty of evidence to show that carbon markets around the world and cap and trade systems themselves aren't producing prices sufficient to spur aggressive emission reductions. It is aggressive emission reductions that we need. This is the scientific consensus. Our timeline is short and urgent. 
We have in the past, via our alternative budgets, developed proposals for carbon pricing that were versions of a carbon tax with very explicit recommendations to ensure that the revenue is used to ensure the equitable and just transition that we need. This is what we still stand by. I hesitated to come here to facilitate making this very ineffective and inequitable cap and trade system a little less ineffective and a little less inequitable. But if that's all we can hope for, our main recommendations are as follows. The framework needs to clearly define the greenhouse gas cap emissions and target for declining emissions. So we would agree with Stephen Thomas and the Ecology Action Centre. It needs to be below the business as usual case. Indeed, we know that Paris and our pan-Canadian framework are conservative targets. There must be ongoing consistency and transparency in the decision and the definition of what that baseline is. We need strong accountability built in so that Nova Scotians have full information about what assumptions are being used. This legislative framework should indeed remove the provision that allows for allowances to, give, to be given away freely. Carbon pollution credits must be auctioned because you must collect revenue, and that is the only way to make this system a tiny bit more effective. The regulations must set a price floor. Obviously, you're looking at following the pan-Canadian framework. The legislation should also mandate how that revenue is to be used. The green fund is what will help us accelerate a just, transi tra a just transition. That's what we need. The Green Fund should not just be a cabinet-appointed leader, but include formalized mechanisms. So we need meaningful engagement of stakeholders, and we must prioritize projects that benefit disadvantaged communities and citizens alongside lowering emissions. We need to do both at the same time. We do support what is outlined by the Affordable Action, uh, Energy Coalition in terms of the specific stipulations for how the Green Fund should be used. What I'm underlining is that we actually need to be doing things differently, not just for the sake of the environment, but while addressing social inequities. We actually have an opportunity here. We need to use a lens that explicitly ensures that both the benefits and the costs are weighed fairly according to need and ability. To not do so results in perpetuating inequities. In the province, in this province, it is, always easy, it is not always easy to figure out the impact. Too many decisions are not transparent and not driven by evidence and certainly are not explicit about full accounting for who really benefits and pays the costs. Ultimately, whether something is equitable or inequitable is a question of power. What I'm concerned about is the increased concentration of economic power at the top and a narrow group of elites controlling the show. It means the economic, political and economic change that we need often is diluted or otherwise blocked. In the case of a carbon price, we must ensure that there is not an unfair burden on those who can least afford to make the changes needed to be more energy efficient, those who have the lowest income. It is also means addressing the other forms of inequity in our province, those that intersect with income. We know there are those who are most vulnerable to living in poverty. It is those who have had, not had the opportunities to reach their full potential those who are more likely to be unemployed or underemployed or work in low-wage employment, those less likely to have graduate high school, less likely to attend post-secondary education. Our First Nations people, African Nova Scotians and racialized individuals, people with disabilities and new immigrants. Ultimately, this is a question of explicitly addressing how people have been excluded and considering things around marginalization and dismantling barriers and being very explicit about that. It also means addressing geographic inequities. It means considering very carefully what the current income distribution is in our province, what the consumption patterns are, what the poverty rates are, what is our unemployment rate, and how does it differ for different communities. It also means considering current government spending and taxation patterns. It is the case that those least able to mitigate the unfair impact are the least to blame. Emissions are related to consumption patterns. People with low incomes have smaller carbon footprints, but they are also least able to deal with higher prices. Equity means mitigating the unfair impact 
on those least able to cope, which is the urgency in terms of the adverse effects of climate change, whether that's flooding, whether that's heat waves, and the public health impacts, let's not forget. It means considering and redressing issues such as environmental racism, where racialized minority communities are disproportionately exposed to pollutants or denied fair access to ec ecological benefits such as clean water and air. It means ultimately ensuring that those with the least bargaining power are not negatively impacted and those with the most bargaining power are able to avoid paying their fair costs, whether that's workers or business owners. We must have revenue so that the Green Fund can help develop green jobs programs, develop skills on a wide range of new work, create decent work for traditionally disadvantaged populations. Some of these initiatives should include expanded public transit, retrofit for buildings, affordable housing, green jobs training, forest conservation and stewardship. A climate justice approach seeks win-win outcomes, employment, health and well-being, and systemic changes that reduce emissions. A fair and effective, equitable carbon pricing system is one part of what is needed. Carbon pricing must be instituted within a whole package of other renewable energy and energy efficiency policies that also advance equity. The fact that our province currently provides an incentive for people to consume energy via an energy tax rebate is a problem. The more energy one conserves, the more you get a rebate. Releasing the data on who benefits from this rebate in terms of income is one example of the kind of information required to re redesign policies such as this and better use resources to ensure fair and equitable transition. I will end with this. I stress again the need for transparency and education on the impact of whatever is going to be implemented so that it is possible to hold our government to account because we need to aggressively deal with climate change equitably and fairly. The few changes we explicitly recommend to the legislative framework will only help make this system a tiny bit less ineffective. Ultimately, what is required is an overarching vision that connects and builds strong climate, industrial and labour market policies for the green industrial changes needed. Climate action should be seen as a new economic agenda, indeed an opportunity. We need the right mix of stringent regulations and standards and public investments to reshape our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sonier. Questions? Mr. Burrell. Thank you. Um, could you sp speak a little bit to uh, the kind of program, in your view, uh, that could reduce emissions uh, and also uh, address or mitigate potential impacts for people of lower income? Sure. So you mean, uh, aside from cap and trade, or how to make cap, cap and trade a bit less? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, both, okay, yeah, well, both. I mean, we, we are on record in terms of our proposals to support a carbon tax um, and very explicitly using revenue to either, for example, increase the affordable living tax credit, which uh, would help low and, and moderate income Nova Scotians. So you really, you take a portion of that fund and you put it there, or you, you build a carbon benefit and you ensure that 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 those who are least able to shoulder the burden of, of making the kind of changes that we're, we're suggesting here, whether that's buying the electric car or otherwise, um, are, are not burdened. Uh, so we are on record in support of, of a carbon tax. Uh, you know, I've certainly looked at the evidence around cap and trade uh, versus carbon tax, and, and the evidence is clear that the carbon tax is, is something that can allow us to accelerate the change that it's needed. The cap and trade systems, as I mentioned, really haven't shown um, that to be true. Thank you. Ms. Sand. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick question. Thank you for your presentation. So would you then also recommend the amendments that have been suggested by both the EAC and the uh, Affordable uh, Coalition? 
Yes, yes, energy we coalition. would support uh, both the Affordable Energy Coalition's recommendations around what to do with the Green Fund, if indeed there is revenue there, um, right. as well as what uh, the Ecology Action Centre has recommended in terms of the emissions. We don't actually support, however, tying into a larger market at this point. Um, you know, tying into a larger market is about bringing in larger polluters and actually reducing costs. So. In terms of being aggressive, that's not something that we envision as being the fix that's needed for this system. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sonier. Appreciate your time. That uh, is the final presenter for uh, this particular uh, bill. Ms. Zan. Thank you. Uh, would it be possible to make a motion to take this bill back under advisement of these recommendations for uh, 112B, 112E, and 112O, as expressed by our, the presenters, for the department to consider uh, in, in order to bring it back with those amendments? You're, uh, you're free to make a motion on the floor. Yes, um, please. Before we do move the bill, I, I will want to take a five-minute recess. Thank you very much. I appreciate that.
Can I uh, call the meeting back to order, please? I just want to uh, take this opportunity to remind those in the uh, audience uh, that taking of photographs are not permitted. We've had a situation here that a photo was posted online uh, that is against the rules of law amendment, so I would ask kindly that people respect that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Sand. Yes. You. I'd like to make a motion to amend Bill 15 to include uh, the changes, recommendations made by the EAC, specifically for 112B, and also the recommendations made for the changes to 112E and 112.0, as specified by the Affordable Energy Coalition. So it would be necessary to prepare a document um, to capture the essence of these um, amendments that you're proposing. Um, We have a motion on the floor. Are you asking to withdraw the motion? No, I'm not asking to withdraw the, the motion. I'm asking if we should take a recess till tomorrow so we can prepare the document you're requesting. So just clarity here, so we're following procedure. Sure. Um, we can defer the motion to a, another meeting of law amendments, but if the motion is left on the floor, we're in a position we have to vote on it. So if it's your request to defer the motion. No, I, I don't think, I, no, I don't want to defer the motion unless it's just till tomorrow so that we can prepare the, the document. Perhaps we could even get it to them by the end of the day. What time is it right now? Or we could get it to you probably by the end of the day. So we our, have to get our office staff our to next prepare. law amendments, um, most likely Thursday. Hmm? But you said we're still going to have to vote on this now, or can we... If, if, if your motion is to defer the motion, if that's your request, we can defer the motion. But if you're putting the motion on the table today, mm -hmm. we are in necessary to vote. Okay. Hold on a sec. Okay, no, we, we'd like to put the, the motion forward today. Uh, we have a motion on the floor. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, signify by saying nay. Nay. The motion is defeated. Ms. Ann. Mr. Chair, sorry. So now I'd like to ask for my deferral. so that we can prepare the document. The motion has been defeated. Okay, thank you. Yes. He's right. Mr. Horn.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion uh, for Bill Number 15, Environment Act, that move be moved without uh, amendment. We have a motion on the floor. All those in favour, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those. Makes sense to me. Move the bill to the floor. Yeah. Without amendments. All those opposed, signify by saying nay. The motion is carried. We uh, will be moving to Bill 7, the Workers' Compensation Act. We have uh, one presenter, Eunice Abaga. Come forward, Ms. Abaga. Welcome. Please take a seat. Just a reminder uh, to presenters, uh, we have uh, 10 minutes to present your comments mm -hmm. and uh, five minutes uh, for committee members to pose questions and extend you an opportunity to provide uh, additional information through your answers. So the floor is yours. Thank you. I just have a quick uh, suggestions and comments on section three item D that talks about enhanced protection for employees who take action on environmental harm. Um, my first suggestion is that before the bill is passed, we need to, uh, I'm suggesting that um, you develop standards and guidelines to protect employees from being victimized and re-victimized when they report environmental health concerns related to exposure to pollutants and chemicals at the workplace. One way this could be done is to establish a non-partisan committee that provides oversight of effective implementation and conformity of the act whereby work parties involved in the investigation of complaints and appeals should not be members of the workplace. So for example, if an employee in a given department brings forward concerns and their managers are saying, no, that is not something we should be talking about, how do you prove there has been environmental harm? the department heads should not be part of the investigation around any issues to do with the environmental harm. So there should be some kind of uh, an independent non-partisan committee that will provide the oversight for the act conformity and any kind of uh, audits. And because the environmental harm in the workplace especially crosses different departments, it would be uh, good if representative of that suggested non-partisan independent committee to include Department of Education, Department of Health, Department of Environment and Lab and Advanced, and if possible, Department of Justice because the environmental justice issues around environmental harm uh, cannot be understood without having that justice lens framework. So before the bill gets to the level of an act, I would suggest that there is consultation at all levels on what should be included in those standards and guidelines and on how implementation and conformity of the act will be governed and reported to the public. It's my hope that the law amendment committee will uh, take this seriously and ensure that the guidelines are developed and vetted before the act is passed both employers and employees 
should be included in the consultation, especially people who have had cases of environmental harm from the workplace. I would also, um, it should also be noted that having an item about enhanced for protection for employees without mentioning anything about employers and their representative bodies would be uh, a little bit risky because if nothing is mentioned or there's no kind of support or ways to protect the employers when issues of environmental harm comes about, it becomes that they try, uh, in some cases, they try to blame it on the individual, yet it's a collective issue. And if the environmental harm that is happening at the workplace is not something tangible, then it's in the head of the employee. So I suggest that there should be consideration of establishing minimum requirements or some kind of benchmarks for effectively supporting the employers to respond on environmental harm complaints in the workplace. Cases involving environmental harm in the workplace should be viewed from an environmental justice perspective. Uh, currently, when you look at uh, the guidelines or the act on uh, duty to accommodate, there is a statement that talks about reasonable accommodation, but there's nothing that mentions anything to do with adequate accommodation. I would suggest that there should be provision of adequate accommodation for employees who experience environmental harm in the workplace. This is necessary to strike a balance between what is considered reasonable accommodation and adequate accommodation while preserving people's integrity and respecting their privacy to their medical information. So if an employee has issues to do with environmental harm or if they are working in a building that is a sick building, when they have to prove to the management, sometimes managers require the entire file of their medical as if they want to see the whole life of their medical, but they should be more specific to what they're looking for if they have to do the accommodation. Last but not least, I would suggest that the Workers' Compensation Board should consider the psychosocial risks that exhibit psychological conditions among employees with undiagnosed as well as diagnosed environmental health conditions. Research has shown that some environmental triggers actually make depression worse and people don't have to be in the field fighting in war to have post-traumatic stress. These are the forms of post-traumatic stress based on how employees are treated at work and especially if they have environmental harm that cannot be seen. And so the emotional abuse that happens in the workplace aggravates their condition. And so that's why I'm suggesting there should be a way to consider the psychological social conditions and not having people with PTSD seen as not deserving when they need long-term disability or anything to do with sick time. Uh, other jurisdictions have disability coverages for psychological injuries in the workplace, so it's my hope that as you consider all aspects of Bill 7, we will explore the possibilities of acknowledging that numerous employees are susceptible to environmental harm in the workplace, and this constitutes injury in the workplace and should be treated just as a broken leg at the workplace. Thanks for the opportunity to present to the committee. Thank you for uh, 
for taking the time. Uh, is it possible to get a copy of your notes? Um, sure. And uh, we'll ensure you get the original back. I'm sorry, I didn't have copies. I just came from the airport and I was told <laughs> to come in today. That's quite all right. Thank you. Ms. McFarlane. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I want to thank you for coming in and having the courage to speak to us. Uh, I understand that if there is an environmental issue that's causing um, effects on the employees, I would hope that the government um, would step in and correct that before it caused any damage or harm to any individual. So I just want to make sure you are aware that there's places within government to report um, such incidents. But earlier in your speech, you mentioned something about having, I believe, an independent panel? Or So I just want to know if you can elaborate on that and, and where you see this panel, where they would, what department they would fall under. I'm actually, uh, I'll give you an, a context of why I suggested what I did. I, I don't know whether you are aware that some of the gov uh, government buildings where we have offices have been termed sick buildings, like the Johau, sometimes back. I worked in that department. I'm speaking as a citizen, though. And um, when I was having issues to do with environmental illness and reported it, I was moved from one corner of the building to another corner of the building to another level of the building and back to the floor that I was. And much later, um, we moved to a different building, and uh, there was this medical information that actually recommended uh, air purifier, but when I mentioned adequate um, accommodation is, if you are in a 10 by eight space, you're working in that air or triggers for your environment, are taken care of in that space, but that's not where you work the entire day. Um, you face a risk of having triggers that are misunderstood, and then when you report, you are told, no, um, it's in your head. And so that's, when I'm saying independent uh, committee, I don't expect it to be the same management in the um, office where an employee is. I was actually thinking, and I might be out to lunch, so you can forgive me. I was th when I mentioned the word nonpartisan, it would be made of um, representative from the five different committees that I spoke about, as in people who work in those departments and probably some representation from outside government for organizations or agencies that understand this particular kind of condition. Say, for example, fibromyalgia is one of the conditions that uh, gets triggered by environment and other things. So I don't know the structure of that independent, but the reason I'm suggesting that is if you are my manager, and you don't think it is happening, that the condition doesn't exist, and I've brought a complaint to you, how objective is that investigation going to be if you are the one saying, no, it doesn't exist? That, that's what I meant. So I really don't know how that structure would work, okay. and, and it, it would be made of not just a representative for the governing party at that time, but some some kind of neutrality is what I'm uh, suggesting. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Oh. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. As, as noted at the start of the session, we had circulated an amendment to uh, LAC Gov 1 
uh, for this bill and uh, I do move that the bill number seven, the Workman's Compensation Act. Excuse me just for a moment if I may. You're free to go. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. In regards to that amendment, um, I move that bill number seven, the Workman's Compensation Act, uh, be reported back to the House with uh, those amendments noted in LAC Gov 1. Sorry. Mr. Wilson. I guess I was jumping the gun on that a little bit. My apologies, I should have known better. Uh, I'd like to uh, move uh, the amendment, LAC Gov 1, uh, to Bill Number 7, Workman's Compensation Act, as amended. We have an amendment on the floor. All those in favor? Signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, signify by saying nay. The motion is carried. Mr. Wilson. Now, if I may, Mr. Chair, I move that uh, Bill Number 7, the Workmen's Compensation Act, be reported back to the House with certain amendments. We have a motion on the floor. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying nay. The motion is carried. Take a uh, two minute recess.
order. I call this meeting of law amendments to order, and we will move on to bill number 27, Intimate Images and Cyber Protection Act. Um, there are no representatives here, although we did um, have some submissions that were distributed earlier. I think everyone received those. Yes, Mr. Wilson. Yes, uh, I move that Bill Number 27, the Intimate Images and Cyber Protection Act, be deferred for consideration at a later date. There's a motion on the floor to defer Bill Number 27 to a later date. Ms. Zan. Thank you. I'd, I'd just like to make a note here that um, many people have written to us saying that there was not enough time for them to get here to make representation presentations and most of the people who wanted to make presentations are very concerned about not getting rid of the cyber scan unit and uh, I just want to make sure that that is on the record. Thank you, Ms. Zan. Um, there will be time for more law amendments as they proceed. So are we ready to vote? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Next is bill number 33, the Gas Distribution Act. No representatives that we have? Any submissions? We have our government change. Oh, we have one change. Mr. Jessam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, legislative uh, Council distributes the this government amendment. Uh, I'll just briefly say that uh, the changes that you're uh, about to look at uh, have to do uh, with a change in wording. Um, it's a fairly minor change, but it is it is material in the sense that we're we're talking about uh, identifying a spe specific geographic location versus uh, enabling the entity the ability to um, transport the product. Um, so uh, we'll be changing, uh, or we'll be uh, for the consideration of the committee, I guess, uh, moving this amendment to delete uh, the word to. Uh, on page one, clause one, uh, subsection 30, um, bracket two, uh, the second time it appears in the sec second line and substitute it with the word four. Uh, just a brief, uh, I guess, oversight uh, when, when, the, uh, when the bill was initially put forward. So I so move. Any discussion? No? We'll go for the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. There being no further business, I... Ad oh, sorry. Mr. Jessam. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, I move that Bill Number 33, the Gas Distribution Act, be reported back to the House as amended. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Now, <laughs> this concludes business for today, and I adjourn the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>